I basically got to a point where I was just like, it was just killing me being in the office. I want to get out and about and do things. And I was just sitting in bed one night and it just clicked to me, the whole concept of it. I don't know where it came from. I do pinch myself, but I tend to slap myself in the face a little bit more when when I have a bad day and I start to have a little bit of a whinge about something or, or I've had like a long day podcasting and then you go, hey, you seriously sit here talking about fancy sport every day of your life. Since the bloke in a bar sort of things come on, I've found myself doing live shows to thousands of people and that's where you sort to sit there and go, this is a bit surreal. If I wasn't good enough to get paid being down on the field playing, if I can get paid to be in the stands watching it, writing about it, that's the next best thing, isn't it? I loved it there and I learned so much and I said, worked with great people and you know a lot of the sport journals, particularly the NRL ones, copied this a lot of stick but Buzz famously like mate Buzz was so good to me from from the second I started there it was just he just taught me so much and more than anything he was a lovely boy it was great but I was just not getting out I thought the longer I went the more opportunities I'd get to get out and go to games and report and do all the good stuff and it just wasn't happening I reckon I am one of the only sport journalists in the world who can work on Monday to Friday Alright guys, welcome back to another episode. This was such a great one. I enjoyed it so much, so much so that it went for almost two hours. Um, today we had on the podcast, Tim Williams, the creator of SC Playbook. Now his journey, you'll hear in a minute, is really crazy and why I love these stories so much. Tim is another example of someone who took their biggest hobby and passion and found a way to turn that into their full-time job and business. Now it's crazy the growth he's had. He's went from a journo at uh, Daily Telegraph, which is a great job in of itself, but someone, there was a lot of things about the job he didn't like and he got that itch to go out and do something for himself and the way he planned it out and executed on it and how it's grown is extremely extremely uh, inspirational for everyone to listen so I'm excited for you guys to hear his story now we'll get into the episode in a second can I just ask for a couple quick favors if you're watching on YouTube uh, could you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already uh, and if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you could leave a five-star review that really helps the podcast really helps it grow and I'd appreciate it so much anyway Let's get into the pod. All right, this is an episode a lot of my friends will know I've, I'm, I'm really, really interested in, in in this space. We were just chatting a, a, a off air before we started, and Tim Williams is, is is our guest on the podcast today. A lot of you, I'm sure, are coming to listen because you know Tim and his story, but for my listeners um, – the reason I was so keen to have Tim on, he's another person and you'll see as we start talking through his journey and you can already feel my energy in this, that I love this shit so much. Anyone that has been able to take a real life interest or hobby or passion of theirs and figure a way to make that their livelihood, their everyday job, their business. Now, Tim's one as well. For a lot of you that maybe aren't as interested in sport and you're more here for, for the business side of things, you might think this is like quite a niche thing he's been able to make his business of. And I think that's why it's so interesting. Something as, as you know, niche to some as, as fantasy sports, which we'll get into and we'll explain what he does. He's been able to make his full-time business and works every day. We were just laughing about it off air before we started. He does about six podcasts a week. That's his full-time job now, talking about just the things he loves most, footy, sports, punting, fantasy, <laughs> all this stuff. So it's really crazy and like... I just, for everyone listening, regardless of kind of how random you think your interest is, whether it be, you know, art or, you know, whatever, anime or collectibles, whatever it may be, there's a real clear path to, to turning that into your, your livelihood. And then it all starts with, you know, an idea and then deciding, you know what, you know, screw it, I'm going to actually try. So Tim Williams, founder of SC Playbook, welcome to the podcast, man. I'm excited to have you on. Thanks, mate. I appreciate you uh, having me on the show and talk about niche industries. Niche is good. <laughs> yeah. Niche is good because not everyone's going out, not everyone's attacking it. So there's uh, there's opportunity there as there was with uh, Supercoach, with, as you said, we'll get there shortly in fancy sports, but no, I appreciate you having me. For sure. And for, for as well, people listening, I, I think like just in hearing the way he goes about things, one thing, whether you're in business or you're a content creator in whatever chosen field, one thing Tim's done, and I'm someone who's been a part of his community for a couple of years, Tim has built the biggest community in that space, the most loyal. And whether you're in business, like an e-com store, like myself or Yui, or you're a content creator, building community is the is the future of business. And it is really, really important. So the over-delivering value and the way you kind of set thing, these things up, I think there's a lot of really interesting things you'll be able to pick up just hearing the way Tim's Tim's gone about things. But where I want to start, Tim, obviously we'll go through your whole journey and how you got to where you are today. Just that thing I said to you right before we started recording, it's like, Dude, like, do you ever pinch yourself realizing like what your job is? Like you're just talking to all your, all your mates about sport, about all these different things as your full-time job. 
I do pinch myself, but I tend to slap myself in the face a little bit more when <laughs> when I have a bad day and I start yeah. to have a little bit of a whinge about something or, or I've had like a long day podcasting and then you go, mate, you seriously sit here talking about fancy sport every <laughs> yeah. day of your life. And as you said, um, punting and I do cricket and all sorts of things. So, yeah, it really is. And particularly I think the, the last two years things have – have kicked off probably more like in the public face and getting mm-hmm. a few more public gigs like the SC plays side of things. It's been going well for a number of years now, but publicly probably not as much, but I think since the bloke in a bar sort of things come yeah. on, I've f- found myself doing live shows to thousands of people and that's where you sort of sit there and go like, this is a bit surreal. So. Yeah. And, and that point you made, it's such a good point. Like I was actually, I took, I, I took an ice about it. Last, last week, actually on this Monday when we had him on the podcast, like that gratitude thing. And it's like, you can have those really long days or you'll be up late editing a podcast or whatever. And you start feeling a little bit sorry for yourself. Yeah. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so drained. But then you realize, dude, four years ago, five years ago, I would have killed to be in this position. You mm. know what I mean? So I think regardless what your pursuit is, you're always going to have those feelings. Um, but it is really cool to like, like you said, you slap yourself in the face and realize, no, <laughs> what I'm actually doing, like it's the best. So can't encourage, encourage people enough to whatever it is that you're interested in or whatever you, you have a dream of starting a business or a YouTube channel, or whatever, just do it because I'm an example. Tim's an example. Yui behind the, 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 the buttons is an example of what's possible when you go and, and, and give it a crack. So let's start from the start. Tim Williams, obviously a proud, <laughs> proud Kuma man. Um, for those that know Kuma on the foot of the snowy mountains in, in New South Wales, if you've ever been to Perish or a Threadbow, you've driven through Kuma, uh, one of the all-time snow and ski uh, shops as well down there. So <laughs> give us a bit of a – give the people listening because I know a lot of people, as I said, will want to hear the Tim Williams story. What was life like growing up in Kuma? Paint the picture of a, of a young Tim Williams. Cold, mate. Very yeah, I can cold. imagine. Mm, yeah, Kuma's a lovely town and uh, my heart will always be there. Old girl's still down there. And yeah. it's, as you said, the the heart, the foot of the snowy mountains. So it's an hour from coastal towns like Tartham, Marimbula, an hour from Canberra, uh, and then an hour from the slopes as well. So a, a great, great place there. I, I was there until sort of end of year 10 and then came up to Sydney for a couple of years of school and then back there for my gap year. Most people go to Europe, I went back to Kuma. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was a beautiful place to, to grow up in, like quite a small country town of about 8,000 people. I had uh, obviously the oldies down there and my two brothers and yep. just – Childhood was sports, sports, sports. Yeah, I can surprise, imagine. surprise. So, did you get to the snow much, or were you too yeah. worried about getting injured for footy or whatnot? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> so we got to the snow plenty, and mate, yeah. I was so fortunate. We used to have for the winter semester every Wednesday for the entire semester, so 10, 11, 12 weeks, whatever it was. We yeah. go to the slopes. So we'd have four day weeks. School and, sport at the snow. Yeah, that's ridiculous. School sport was a day off to go to the slopes and you'd get like cheap gear and you sort of alluded to a little bit before, but rhythm sm- snow sports. So <laughs> yeah, shout out shout to them, one of the greatest uh, s- ski shops on the planet. One of the biggest as well, surely. Yeah, but it never ends it's all store. over the place now. So if, yeah, if you want success stories, get, uh, get that lot <laughs> yeah, on. We'll get them, we'll get them in. <laughs> Um, but that, that's, that's kind of what I, what I pictured for you. So tell me, obviously you mentioned you got two brothers, one of them very famously played over hundred NRL games as a halfback, the, mm. probably arguably the most important position on the field. Um, how were you as, as, as an athlete, were, was professional sports as a player ever on the cards for you? It was always the dream, mate. Yeah. I, I went well enough. Yeah. I was never really going to be a, a superstar or mm. I don't think uh, make a professional career, career and full-time job out of it. I think I was pretty handy sort of footy and cricket in the, the lower grades, but yeah. – you, you find out pretty quickly when you move to Sydney that you're uh, you're a big fish in a, a very very <laughs> small pond and whatnot. Yeah. So, I uh, yeah, what I said went all right in a few different sports and sort of came up to to school in Sydney, sort of hoping you know, maybe there's a future there. Especially as you said with uh, my brother Sam having yeah. sort of paved the way a little bit and had a bit of an idea for it, and a little bit of an in there to a few contacts. And you get up to Sydney and mate, I was. Uh, I was just a very small body. So <laughs> I've always said that I probably should have been playing Aussie rules, not rugby yeah. league because I, you know, I was about 60 kilos, 65 kilos in year 11 and 12. And you're coming up against some of these big boys from out West and some of the big footy schools just going like, Oh, I don't stand a chance. Yeah. I think thinking back to my <laughs> own junior rugby league days, like, mm. yeah, we're, we're, I'm like this skinny little white boy mm. playing like same thing, playing halfback and then move to fullback up against these big islanders. Like, Oh my God, yeah. how am I going to tackle you? Did, did, was it as multicultural <laughs> in Kuma or like, was like 
you, your size disparity wasn't as evident down there. Size disparity was not as evident. <laughs> yeah. we, we played in the, the Canberra comp through okay. juniors yeah. and like Cooper itself, a very multicultural town. Okay. It was like during like the, the initial snowy hydro scheme, I think it was in the, the 50s, might have been a little bit earlier, that was, it would have been 50s, um, people came from all over the world uh, to come and work on the snowy scheme. And yeah. so that's gone through the whole town now. But – you know, when we'd go and play footy, there's also like a lot of farmers around. So a lot of our footy team was made up of just these tough country farmer boys that I was not one of them. And <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'd go and play a lot, a lot of Canberra kids. So yeah. it was it was a rude awakening to come to Sydney. You know, I remember we we played a few school footy carnivals where you'd, you'd make a rep team here or there, and you'd end up playing as a team from Sydney, and you just eyes would light up at twelve years old, going, "I'm like seriously, I yeah." Just do- literally twice my size at the age. And uh, when I eventually did get up to Sydney and played some footy, like I went all right, but I just uh, slide myself further and further towards the wing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just got to keep yourself safe, hide yeah. out there in the wing best you can. What positions did you play growing up? A uh, bit of a – it would have been a bit – I was going to say a bit of a Connor Watson, but I don't cover the forwards well enough for <laughs> Connor Watson. A uh, bit of utility. So yeah. back line. Uh, I played at halfback uh, sort of in Kuma. Mm-hmm. Probably never my best position. Just again, just a small country town. You sort of someone to sort of steer the ship a little yeah. bit. But uh, I always loved fullback. Fullback was always my favourite position. And then the older I sort of got, and I played a bit of footy even during uni, and even sort of quite recently in Sydney. And just all depending on fitness levels. If I was fitting in good shape, I'd be playing fullback. <laughs> if I wasn't, I'd be playing centre. So, yeah. but any basically anywhere from one to seven. Yeah. So, were you the youngest of the of the three brothers? Yeah, yeah. What was that like growing up with two older <laughs> brothers? Like. Did they help toughen you up or teach you the game in, in, in certain ways or? Definitely toughened you up, I think. Yeah. We just obviously spent our, all our afternoons and I remember every origin night we'd just be out in the backyard at halftime. You'd, you'd jam in 15 minutes of just smacking each other and whatnot. <laughs> and I guess they probably had a, a few commands from uh, mum and dad to go a little bit softer on me, but you know, very minorly. So to grow up in that environment with older brothers who we do the same, we play footy in the backyard and play tackle footy. You sort of, you had to learn to tackle pretty quickly. I I couldn't believe, I don't know why, like I've been, yeah, I've been, you know, for me sport, I, you know, I work a lot. I, um, I now luckily, you know, in terms of the gratitude piece, like when I first started in e-commerce, it's obviously a lot of staring at a screen, Mm. you know, spreadsheets, ad accounts, that sort of stuff. But over the last couple of years, obviously I have a podcast. I do heaps of mentoring with other people starting businesses. So by the end of the week, I do a lot of talking to people like you do. And sometimes like I get, I I am an extroverted person, but I'll get to like a Friday night and I've just been talking to people nonstop all Mm. week and I love it. But now I want to rest in my me time is sport. And for me, I don't know what it is. Watching live sport is like nothing else compared to watching a Netflix show or series. I just love it. And I think for anyone going hard, chasing whatever goal, having your outlet is, is important, right? But that's the kind of what sport did for me. But what made you fall in love with sport? Was it just this being surrounded where you were? What was it about sport that, that you love so much? Yeah. Again, growing up surrounded by it, like mm. my parents were both sport lovers, Cooma itself, a big sporting town. So I'd be playing you know, during winter rugby union on Saturday, rugby league on a Sunday. Mm. I remember even sort of when I was in, in year nine, 10, I was traveling to Canberra for a few um, rep sides there and you'd leave and you'd train, you'd drive to Canberra, which is sort of where we trained was about an hour and a half away. Three days a week, you got to leave school early for that, which was great. And then I Should remember- went to school in Cooma. Yeah, but it was a great place. It was a great place. <laughs> uh, and then there'd be- Sundays where I'd play footy down the coast and travel back up after the game and go to cricket training in Canberra. So you're covering sort of two hours south, two hours back, then now and now half back north to Canberra to get through all the, the sport. And I, myself, my brothers, we're very competitive uh, when it when it comes to sport, just mm. wanting to win things. Yeah. Not in a negative way and never in a bad way at all. Like it's always played with uh, the right intentions in mind, but I just love the competitive nature of it. And even now I still play Oztag once or twice a week yeah. and try and play a bit of tennis. I, I play a fair bit of golf. I had a couple of games of footy last year. How'd the body hold up? It's fine, mate, at yeah. the moment. <laughs> yeah. So I turned 30 not long ago yeah. and uh, body's still holding up all right. So I still would like to play a bit more footy, but – the bigger probably SC playbook's grown, the less opportunity I've had to do yeah. it. And training in particular, my weekends aren't too bad, mm-hmm. but 
just finding the time to go to training and do different things is a little bit harder. But uh, the boots aren't hung up yet. <laughs> yeah. But with every year that I don't have a game, we're getting a little bit closer. Yeah. Just a quick one from me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'd know that after scaling Happy Skin Co. to over $10 million per year, I spent close to 18 months creating the Viral Brand Builder program which teaches someone with zero experience how to launch and scale their very own e-commerce brand. With over 100 training videos and direct access to me, including one-on-one -on -one calls, you'll be guided throughout the entire process. Now, we already have a bunch of incredible results from students that are making multiple five and six figures per month. So if you want to learn how to build a business that has the potential to completely change your life, then click the link in the description and book in an application call today. Spots are limited as you'll be speaking directly to me. So hopefully I'll chat to some of you soon, but until then, let's get back to the podcast. Um, just on that sport and that, that competitive nature, like you, you said, I'm oh, not in a bad way. And I, I don't think being competitive at all is, is a bad way. I think like, you know, we, you, I can only speak of our generation coming up and I feel like everyone was a lot more competitive then. Mm. And I feel like, you know, sport's a really good way to bring that out of people, but talking about like competing against your brothers and everything, I come, I, I don't know how I've been listening to the playbook for, for, for years. As I said, sports kind of my outlet. And when I found super coach, it's like, you know, you go from watching just the Bulldogs play. I'm a Bulldogs, a, a Doggies <laughs> fan to watching fucking almost every game yeah, if you can. Yeah. So it was, it was really good in that nature. Been listening for ages and I never put two and two together. That big revelation the other week that Spy is actually your brother. I yeah. never, I don't know why I never would have put the two and two together, but yeah. Interesting. I never would have thought it. It was remarkable, that one, with, with the spy. You would have and, shocked a lot of people. And, and when we first started uh, SC Playbook, there was about six people and I was one of them. Uh, my brother Sam was doing bits and pieces as mm -hmm. well and Sam wasn't really a super coach player. My brother Tom, the spy, yep. the alias spy, <laughs> he was a diehard super coach yeah. player, as people know now. And we sort of spent, oh, do we want three Williamses in the, in the six people and is it too much of representation? And we go – he didn't have like a big finish behind him at the time, despite being a gun at mm -hmm. Supercoach. And we go, let's give him an alias. And, you know, he could be a past winner. He could be an ex-NRL player. Like nobody knows. And it's just built up, built up, built up. And every time he got a little bit fed up with having the alias just because he had to tippy toe around his upbringing and mm. he couldn't say anything referring to Kuma yeah, or, yeah. or the Raiders or anything yeah. because they're like, oh, okay. And every time we'd go to reveal who he was, I'd just, I'd sort of talk to people and you just got the gauge. People didn't know who he was. I just assumed people would work it out. Yeah, no. But I reckon it was about, by then I'm going, oh, probably 50% of people still don't know. Like, that's cool. Let's run with that. Yeah. And started this season, went, all right, mate, we'll, uh, we'll reveal you. And then when <laughs> I did it, it blew my mind. I reckon 90% of listeners had no idea that he was my brother. I had no yeah. idea. I had no idea. And it's like, if you saw, obviously when I was doing my, my research, obviously you can see my notes, everyone laughs. I do a lot of research <laughs> on people. Um, obviously I didn't have to do too much research because I've been following along the journey for a while. But if I see you and like um, you and Sam next to each other, I'd be like, yeah, hundred percent. You can see they're brothers. If I saw you and Spy, obviously, which you're on lots of I never would have thought it, but when I saw the three of you together, it's like the missing link. I can see how he looks like, yeah. like Issa, and then I'm like, fuck, it's so obvious. But yeah, I wanted to ask, what was the reason behind it? So it's a really good explanation. Um, but no, cool. That's fucking really interesting. Now I want to talk to you about kind of the growing up, moving out of Kumar stage of your life. You mentioned you moved up to Sydney, went to a famous rugby league school, St. Greg's. What was that experience like? Different boarding school, especially mm -hmm. yeah, coming from a small country town. But the beauty of it was in the boarding side of things, I was surrounded by country boys as well Yeah. Uh, in terms of the boarding environment. So I think there was – wasn't massive. I think there was probably 120-odd boarders in the school and then, you know, a 1,000 day boys. So the school I went to in Cooma – there's probably a hundred people in it, yeah. maybe 25 people wow. in my year. So like that's, so your whole year is in one class essentially. Yeah, pretty well. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so then by the time I got to, to Greg's, it was a very different environment. It's a massive school. But the beauty of like St. Greg's, it was, it was unreal. It, it's changed a lot nowadays, but I, it's really weird describing, but it's just plonked on top of this hill in Campbelltown and it has had 360 degree views of farmland. Yeah. And you couldn't really see any housing, any developments, anything. And it was just the most incredible thing. Like I'd wake up of a morning, look out my window down to just about eight different football fields, looking over the first oval there. It was the most special thing to do. So I was at like, again, getting out of Kuma, which uh, a lot of sort of people from back home do do. They try and go and get year 11 and 12 at boarding school in or some families, a few more. And yeah. it was just a great experience. Learn a lot from it. A lot of good mates still from school there and, very different probably to if I'd stayed in Kuma. Did you go to school there with anyone that's like ended up being like a pretty successful first grader? 
Adam Elliott was in my year oh, and yeah, boarded with me. Yeah, so Ad's, uh, Ad's actually from down my way as well, okay. from a little town called Tartha. So we played footy and cricket against each other growing up. And, again, he was just built like a brick shit house <laughs> from 12 years old. So we were in different comps. We'd play like preseason carnivals yeah. together and you'd come up against him and I was just this twig and I'd go, oh, this will be fun. Uh, but also had a lot of cricket against him. Ad's was... I think the the quickest twelve year old bowler in Australia. Really, really good cricketer. Yeah, these are his words. So take a <laughs> grain of salt. But I did face him, and he was lethal. And I remember one day down in B, we were playing against each other, and I yeah. it had been pouring rain. We got back on the field, and seam slipped out of my hand. I was bowling at him, and Ad was a terrible batsman, and it was just this big beam, and nearly took his head off. And when I did it, he just looked at me like a bull. I just went, oh, no, because I knew how quick he you was. you got to face him next. So he came back out. Then I opened the batting. He opened the bowling. The first ball he bowled, he went about four metres over my head into the boundary. <laughs> I'm like, this is, it. this is about 15 years old or something oh. at the time. So, yeah, school-wise, uh, I think Adam Elliott was my year. Joey Stimson up at the Gold Coast oh, Times yeah. was the year below. Uh, not, a, not a heap from our years, but probably a couple of years above there was like James Tedesco. Mm. Um, there's a bunch from about two, about my brother's year, to be fair. They had a lot of NRL graduates. So he went, he went up to St. Greg's. He went to there. Greg's as well. Yeah. So when you were up there, um, was it still kind of loosely the dream to play footy or had you already sort of started thinking about journalism and, and what could, what could happen next if not sport? Going to school there, the dream was always to play rugby league professionally, but I was also realistic. I'm like, yeah, as I yeah. said, I wasn't. I went well. I wasn't a well beater. So yeah. it was like, and then you, once I got up there, you quickly know where you're at. And you go, like, yeah. oh, I'm not going to play NRL. Especially like, sorry to cut you off. In a, in a school like that, where it is like such a famous school for like rugby league prodigies coming from there. And it took about like cross code, like all, all the athletes, like I was watching under, under 19's origin last night. Did you watch yeah. it? Yeah. I saw it. We'll talk about footy more at the end yeah. of the podcast. Um, but like, Obviously, as a doggies fan, watching pretty cleanly, Mitch, Mitch Woods yeah. had like contract offers from like AFL Union, Rugby League. It's like all these really talented athletes. There's a lot of research coming out now that pl playing multiple sports actually can help with the sport that you end up like specializing in moving forward. But it just seemed like the rite of passage. Everyone winters is footy and 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 summers are cricket. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I was kind of the same. Like I – went to public schools and like, it's easy to be good. You know, when you, to be one of the good players in a public school, the second you make any rep teams, you're like, Oh, I'm shit. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, you know, great reality check, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So my, um, my dreams of playing like, you know, professional sport died quite young as well, but lucky I, um, I had a brain on, on a head on top of my shoulders. Thank God. Well, well yeah, I, I was, I'm grateful that I was smart enough to work out early enough that <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of years like slugging away. Trying and to make I know, it. And it's not a knock on any of them, but I know there's a lot of players that are playing sort of Ron Massey Cup, like scraping New Wales Cup, the levels just below sort of the NRL and they're just busting their ass. They're 26, 27. And I admired every bit of it but they're still trying to crack it. And it's like, oh, I'm glad I didn't beat myself up for that long. So yeah. like, to be fair, a lot of them still probably a chance. I'm like, I would have been going nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that's, that's so like that, but then you see people like, who was it? There was someone like, was it, is it Ruben Porter? He's like 27, 28 years old. Yeah. He's playing for the Tigers now. And like, was just like a reserve grade journeyman. And they get the shot. Cody Walker. Cody like, was about 26, 26 when he got his yep. debut. And now like, we'll probably have 10 years as one of the premium players. So like, Dreams do come true if you stick with it, but like, yeah, whatever your chosen you know, field is, self awareness very key. Exactly right. right self awareness yeah. key. So when does when does um journalism hit your radar then? Uh, probably the day I arrived in Sydney and started playing against the boys from out west and yep. realised that I wasn't going to play NRL. Yeah. Um, it was just always the I don't want to say backup plan because that had insinuate that I thought I was going to play NRL, which I wasn't. Um, but I just wanted to work in sport mm. and. I've always liked speaking to people. I've always been pretty uh, extroverted. So, yeah, as soon as I sort of finished year 12 up here, uh, we, I said, went back home for a year and worked and put the uni applications in and it was just, yeah, journalism was very much on the radar and I didn't know exactly how or where I'd fit into it, but probably newspapers and reporting yeah. was uh, what I had in mind and sort of end up there, which we'll get to a bit later. But, yeah, it was, I never really thought about doing anything other than, than journalism. So it was, it was mainly something you knew you wanted to work in sport. And if you're not going to play, that's probably yeah. the best way yeah. to, to get into it, right? Well, well, my logic was that if I wasn't good enough to get paid being down on the field playing, 
if I can get paid to be in the stands watching it and writing about it, that's the next best thing. Isn't yeah, it? pretty pretty damn close. So how does yeah. how does that all start? You ended up going to Wollongong Uni, right? How was that experience living on campus? Amazing. Yeah. yeah, great decision. So I remember I was tossing up at the time, do I go to uni in Canberra or Wollongong? And no disrespect to Canberra because I love the place. <laughs> I ended up in Wollongong and I'm like, thank God for that. Um, yeah, so I went to uni, did a double degree there in journalism and communication and media studies yep. and had a ball there, loved the uni experience. The camps that we were on was a two-minute walk across the road to the beach. Uh, yeah, they had two years on campus, so the liver was sore by the end of it. I, I played footy for the West Devils while I was down yeah. there during uni and I remember uh, – I saved up and had a Euro trip in 2014, my first year of uni. Came back from that, back into the footy season. At the first game back, I just remember going, this is tough yard from campus into Europe, into footy. But yeah. uh, it was, I loved it. I um, very briefly went to to uni, went, went down to Wollongong as well. Yeah. I was. Um, campus? I wish. This yeah. is, that's where I'm going with this. Like I, I, um, I actually had early entry, so I could kind of pick where I wanted to go. I was doing law, realized pretty quickly that, Fuck, I, um, for one, like I just – I could never put myself through <clears throat> reading 80 pages of the most yeah. dull material ever. So I didn't last long. But, like, when I was talking to my year advisor, who I'm still actually great mates with from school, we catch up from, from time to time, he was saying, like, you know – it's because I was doing law. Like, I was I was really, I was smart, but I was, like, public school smart. I'm like, I'm not going to get <laughs> into, like, Sydney Uni or UT. I liked 97, 99. Yeah. I was never going to be like that. So it's like, do I want to go to, like, Western Sydney Uni, like Campbelltown, or do I want to go down to Wollongong? He's like, oh, everyone has so much fun, like the uni bar and whatnot. But you don't get to experience that. Like, I have an hour drive down to uni. I've got to wake up at, like, 7, get to uni, do, like, eight hours of the most boring shit. And then all my mates are like, oh, do you want to go for a drink? I'm like – Dude, I'm falling asleep right now. If I go have yeah. a beer or two, I'm 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 no hope. But that was one of my major regrets. Takes, not living on campus. It at, takes at uni. all the fun out of it, I'd imagine, <laughs> yeah. having to drive down. And oh. you also did a degree that, as you said, requires a lot of work. Like the beauty for me and uh to any aspiring young journalists out there, this is probably not a great message, but <laughs> for me living on <laughs> campus. I could always bullshit my way through an essay quite well. Mm, yeah. And again, I was by no means a genius, but I could just I could write fairly well, yep. um, grammar aside at the time. <laughs> I, I could get by and, you know, I wasn't quite a P's get degrees character. Like I, I went, I think I had distinctions or something. Yeah. Or I was close to about 75, whatever that gets you. Yep. And I went, all right, but when you're doing a, you know, a law degree or a lot of my mates are doing finance degrees, you do your exams, you're right or you're wrong with an answer. Like you can't yeah. have a, a tutor or a lecturer or whatever that likes you, that looks after you and gives you a mark here or a mark there. You're right or you're wrong. Whereas when you're writing essays or writing articles, that sort of stuff, or taking pictures of stuff for journalism, it's very subjective. So it's like it's <laughs> yeah. pretty hard to fail. I've so actually, I got the full experience. Yeah, I've actually had this conversation with with my missus. Um, like, you know, if I had to have a normal job or do a normal degree, even though like from what I've done now, I could never go back. And that was the big realisation, like, I'm just, I have to do my own thing. It's just the way I'm wired. I think I said it like probably would be journalism. It's the thing I think I could get most interested in, but like the whole, you know, in school, I don't know what you were like St. Greg's, maybe a bit more strict. Maybe they kind of get you guys to, to pre-plan your work a little bit more. But I was always like, get home from school, you know, have something to eat, four o'clock, the Simon's due the next day, start it then, finish it by like, mm. you know, 10 o'clock. You try and do that with the law like assignment, and and I did yeah. do it. It's you start at four o'clock, you finish at six a.m. in the morning. You don't sleep all night. You drive an hour down like whatever those roads are without any sleep, and you try and not fall asleep and have a micro even crash your car. Yeah. So it just wasn't sustainable for me. But journalism sounds like something that it is quite interesting for you. Now you, I know you ended up getting a gig at the Daily Telly. How did how did that come about? Yeah, so at the end of my first year of uni, I was actually applying uh, for an exchange over to Boulder in Colorado with a mate. That would have been cool. Which was another like bucket list kind of item. And I I literally had the the forms on my desk and I'd filled them out. I just needed to hand them in. And at the same time, I was like, okay, like I want to do, do journalism and I'm keen on it, but let's just make sure of it. So back in year 10, I did a week of work experience up at the Telegraph just through a family friend. Yep. And I thought, this is cool. So I contacted uh, a fella who was the head of sport when I did the work experience and he'd left and he put me in contact with the, the new head of sport, Tim Morrissey, who's still there now. And I basically just said, look, I'm a 
I was here a couple of years ago, did a week, da, da, you won't remember me, but I'm now uh, studying in Wollongong, doing journalism. I just want to make sure that I'm on track, that it's the industry that I want to be in. Do you have two <laughs> or three days of work experience for me? Because I didn't want to finish my degree, get to the job and go, I hate this, I've wasted <laughs> yeah. my time. Anyway, yeah. he came back to me almost immediately and said, you've timed it well, we've got a full-time full -time internship for you for three months over the summer break. Wow. And I just went, <clears throat> okay, this is probably too good to pass <laughs> up. So that unfortunately meant that I couldn't do the Colorado exchange, which I did end up having mates go there. Would have been amazing, but where I've ended up now, I'm grateful because I ended up going to the telly and doing that internship for three months, stayed at uh, my brother Tom's place in Sydney and ended up getting paid work out of that, which sort of paved the way through to now. So it's it's worked out. Because journalism can be one of those like industries where it's quite competitive and hard to get a job in mm. one of the in one of the major like media houses or publications. Um, what did that three months of uh, uh, as an intern look like at the Daily Telegraph? What sort of stuff were you working on? Bit of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had, I worked with some great people and some very understanding people. Like, you know, you hear horror stories of interns who were just the shit kickers. Just get coffees all day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I had really, really good pe people managing me at the time who understood that, you know, I was 19, living on campus, obviously not through the internship because we'd, we'd gone on break by then. but yeah. and. You know, you know, you're not getting paid. So they sent me out. Like I covered a, a ton of cricket tests, Sydney cricket tests, and they right. sent me out to those for days where probably not a lot of use to them. I'd write a few articles, but I'd be more use in the office, you yeah. know, punching the keys and doing the production side of things. Um, but I, I went and went to a lot to NRL games and reported on those and I'd go around and interview people. And it was really, it was a good environment there in that they'd just say like, if you've got good stories and you've got good t contacts, tap into them. Mm -hmm. Get the story, and if it's good enough, we'll publish it. So, and were you all sport while you were there? Or always you sport. I did. Oh, that's lucky. I was meant to do. A, I, I like I was sport the entire time, and these interns who wanted to be in sport had come through, and they'd do the news side of things. And I remember that I was about two years into it, and I was full time, or three years in, I was full time, and they were saying, "Mate, we've got to diversify you from sport and get you into the news team." And uh, so they sent me out one night, and I did. I was meant to do two or three like overnight shifts. Mm -hmm. And I went around with a, a bloke the overnight, I think he was the photographer, and we just chased like police radio and crashes and all stuff all night. Wow. And it was quite cool. But I was just like, I just want to be in sport. Yeah. I just want to watch footy and write about it. Yeah, like thanks for the experience. <laughs> it was really good. But now I know definitely 100%. Yeah, yeah, I'll just yeah. stick to my sport. Yeah. So did you like when you did that internship and then it turned into obviously a proper – paid role, mm. was that immediately after or did you have like six months after uni to go finish and come back and nah, start officially? So I was working at uh, at a pub my first year of uni yep. down there, uh, which was great, and that obviously turned into the internship over summer and that turned into part-time work when uni went back. So I did, I think it was like November, December, January or something internship and then part-time paid gig from there. So I think predominantly I, I worked Sunday, Mondays, which was great because – Uni nights are always midweek. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, we got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, Fridays, never really a big weekend thing out of the ordinary. So those work days were fantastic. And I'd sort of just jump on the train an hour and a half up and uh, do the days there. And so yeah, it turned into part-time work, which I did through the rest of my degree. And then I actually got a semester off. So I think it was four subjects off the end of my degree because I just said, I've been working at the Telegraph yeah. for like three years by this time. So yeah. I got a bunch of credit points, which was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then basically as soon as I finished uni, might have even been a little bit before I got the full time. So uh, how long were you at the, the Daily Telegraph? And at what point, like in that journey, obviously I'm assuming like towards the, the latter half of it, do you start thinking about, like obviously the Daily Telegraph run Supercoach. Mm. Um, were you like playing it throughout there? Were you involved in the Supercoach team while you were there before you start thinking, mm, maybe I can, you know, do my own thing independently? Yeah, so I was at the telly for – probably five to maybe six years or probably five years. And I loved it there. And I learned so much and I said, worked with great people and, you know, a lot of the sport journals, particularly the NRL ones, couple of just a lot, lot of stick. Buzz but famously. Yeah. Buzz famously. Like, mate, Buzz was so good to me. From from the second I started there, it was just such a – he just taught me so much and more than anything, he was a lovely bloke. Yeah. Like, work aside, if you're a good bloke, I've got time for you and yeah. vice versa. Um and Buzz would do things like he'd give me stories 
and go, mate, put your byline on it. Like it'd be all his, not so much all his work, but he'd have the scoop, he'd have the contact, he'd do it all. Then you go, mate, put your byline on it, stuff. Yeah. And then I'd end up on the front page of the Telegraph with the story that Buzz had given me. Yeah. Like it was the best. And how does that, like, how does it, like, what's the inside world of, like, a journalist look like? How do, like, without revealing the secrets, whatever, I don't know the, the you know, the industry code, but, like, how does it, how does journalists get scoops? Do they have people in, like, what does it, what does that look like? It's always a world of being, like, it's, like, kind of from the outside looking in, it's, like, you don't really know what goes on, so you kind of, like, mystify it and think, oh, that's really cool. It's genuinely just who you know yeah. and, and what your networking looks like, the contacts you build. And, you know, when you're early on in the industry like I was, I I had a few contacts here and there, but not a lot. And, like, I was very fortunate that I had my brother playing the NRL at the time. So through that I knew basically the whole Raiders club and yep. all different sorts of people through through footy from that. But, you know, the big dog journals, it's just there. Like you'd go through – Go through Buzz's phone book. You would have anyone who's anyone, yeah. everyone who's anyone in Australia in it. Like, and you just go through the, these networks and whenever they need, like, could be two minutes until deadline or 20 minutes until deadline and Buzz, oh, who do I need? Oh, yeah, I'll just call bloody, yeah. you know, one of the biggest dogs in Australia. Yeah. And he'd get a yarn, but obviously at my age and my level of experience then, it wasn't like that. For sure. But even things, said that they were very, very encouraging in saying, if you go out and, and get good yarns and – tap into your contacts. We, we love it. And remember the, the dogs played the Raiders at a trial in uh, Bega one year and I was, I was quite young and I got onto the Raiders media manager who was a, a mate of mine, just a lovely fella as well. He's been there for years. So I'm oh, I'm coming down. Um, I'll probably come through like Raiders HQ a couple of days before. Do you mind? Is there anyone I could get in contact with? And yeah. he goes, yeah, mate, we'll, we'll sort a few things out for you. And like this is part of the reason why I love the Raiders and went down there and it was the first – was the week that Johnny Bateman arrived. Okay. So I got the first interview with John Bateman and then- Need a translator? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, funny story about that. I got the uh, the I got the interview with John Bateman, <clears throat> could not understand a word he said <laughs> on the recording. I, like I went back oh. to my editor and I said, mate, listen to this. I go, you can't hear a word, he, understand a word he's saying. And like the deadlines are in half an hour or an hour or something. And I called Sam and I was like, mate, I promised him like a good story and I can't understand anything. Like, they understood. Yeah. He was playing tennis with Jordan Rapana at the time and he gave R- R- Rapper the phone. So I spoke to him and got an article <laughs> out of it, basically having a laugh at how they do it on the field and how they understand yeah. each other. Uh, but at the same trip, the he goes, oh, mate, um, do you want to have a chat to Ricky Stewart? And I'm like, sorry, what? I was uh, like maybe 21 at the time or something, 20. And he goes, Yeah. We uh we'll line him up for you. So I went up there and sat in Ricky's office for half an hour, office for half an hour, chatted to him, asked him anything. He delayed training about five, ten minutes because he was talking to me because he's he, someone called and said, mate, where are you? He's like, I'm out of booth in a minute. I'm like, That's this cool. is ridiculous. Yeah. So I like it. Um yeah, I was fortunate in that sense, but coming through it, you, you do need to know people. <laughs> the guru was that like down in in like a Canberra a couple of weeks ago, and he said he was really impressed with the whole organization as well. Like really good people from top to bottom throughout there. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of like, you know, there's pros and cons of being in Sydney, pros and cons of being down there, but like small town people usually are like, not small town people, but that like. It's a small commu- town vibe. Do you know what is. I mean? Yeah. Like that, that, that's really cool. It's so. almost not at the top end, but at the, at the surface level, it's run like a country club. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. From the, you know, from the receptionist up to Ricky, they've just, everyone's got time for you there. Everyone's so approachable. It's, yeah. it's awesome. So at, at the Daily Telegraph and Supercoach, obviously, Sangst is like the face of it. He's like been the main man. Um, for as long as I've kind of been been following, were you a part of like the super coach team or how did you kind of get into that originally? Yeah. So I, I do a little bits and pieces of writing for it and, and I started doing a few podcasts and like I played super coach before I got there and, and I've always loved it. And the more and more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. And, you know, I was thrown into podcasts when I first started there and I just sat there and went, like, I'm a country bogey. Listen, listen <laughs> how I speak. Like, people aren't going to want to listen to me. And then sort of went half all right, but I was with obviously other people and I learned a lot from it, but I was so raw at the time. Like, yeah. you get a good laugh uh, out of looking back on it. Yeah. I feel like everyone's like that, though. You, like, the first time, you know, like, if I go back and I listen to my first few podcasts mm. now, and at the time you think you're, you're, you're sweet and then you look back, I'm like, holy shit, yeah. what the fuck was I doing? Um Okay, yeah, so you're working a part of that. And then what starts to, you know, what is it inside of you that is like, nah, like this is great. And I'm sure Daily Telegraph is the type of company that once you're in, people usually stay there for a really long time. Mm, they don't really correct. leave. 
what made you like, what was the first thoughts of like, or that itching feeling that you want to, you know, go and do something yourself? Yeah. Going into journalism, like my dad always said, he's like, oh, he goes, yeah, I understand why you want to do it. He goes, just be aware. He goes, you'll lose your weekends. And I'm like, no, this is when I was 16, 17 years old. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, I'll be right. And then the longer it went on, I got into the industry. I'm like, what do you know? I had no weekends. <laughs> and and this is like even sort of post uni and even aside from being social, wanting to catch up with mates and missing out on events, you know, missing out on a lot of 21st and, and whatnot. I couldn't play a lot of sport on weekends, footy in particular, and it killed me. And, and I remember speaking to bosses at the time saying, look, I start at two on a Saturday or three on a Saturday. Can I start at five so that I can play footy? I'm like, just anything and just try to push it all. I'd say, you know, can I just, if I'm working one day of the weekend, can I work the other day or whatever it is? Yeah. And it just, they could never make it work. And it, after long enough, it just started killing me and, and probably the back end of it as well. I was happy to to bide my time, you know, learning the ropes, getting my contacts. And the majority of what I did <clears throat> was a digital producer in terms of sat, like Buzz sent through his articles I would put it up online with headlines and pictures, the, essentially the staff writers, the yeah. cop or the stick when now something <laughs> goes wrong. So that was me. But if I ever wrote something, I didn't put my byline on it. Yeah. But And it became very tedious after a while and it wasn't like – it was fine. The work was great. And when I say I have to slap myself at times, even then, yeah. my Saturday, I'd have like three screens around me. I'd be in the office. I'd have the racing on one screen, the footy on one screen, the swimming or something on the other screen. I'd be going like, it's not bad. And you'd <laughs> yeah. be in the office having a pump while yeah. you work with all the journos and that. And like, it was great, but I was just not getting out. I thought the longer I went, the more opportunities I'd get to get out and go to games and report and do all the good stuff. And it just wasn't happening. And I was still writing stories, but I was doing them from the desk and I was calling people by phone and I, was, I just want to get out of the office and get out and about. Yeah. And like for a company yeah. like that and in that space, it's not like you don't really move up a lot in the ranks in a year or two. It's like a long oh. grind to kind of position yourself in that position. And I imagine as a junior, like you don't really have that much pull or influence to move your, yeah. move your hours around and everything. So when it came to to, to starting SC Playbook and, and, and leaving Daily Telegraph, did you like, had you started it while you were there and then grew it to a certain point and then left? Or did you like, it was a clean break. I'm going to leave this and start this. Yeah. So I basically got to a point where I was just like, it was just killing me being in the office. I want to get out and about and do things. And yeah. I, I was just sitting in bed one night and it just, clicked me the whole concept of it I don't know where it came from but it was probably just years of building up this information yeah. in my head and just went I saw how big Supercoach was mm -hmm. at the Telegraph so for example it's a very subscription based industry and Buzz Rothfeld would go and write some unbelievable article about some reformed junkie who goes and wins Clive Churchill medal uh, in the NRL. Yeah. Not that that's happened, so don't go and search for that. But <laughs> the point is it'd be the best story ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'd sell like 10 subscriptions. Then I'd whip up the top five best buyers of the week in Supercoach in 20 minutes and it'd do 50 subscriptions. And I'm just sitting there going like, this doesn't add up. Yeah. Like people are obsessed with this and they want it so bad. It doesn't matter who writes or whatever. They just want content around it. And I also knew how big fancy sport was in like Europe. Like I play English Premier League fantasy and not a massive, massively into American sports, but NBA fantasy, yep. NFL fantasy, they're enormous. It's massive over there. Yeah, like the one English Premier League fantasy that I play is like 10 million people or something. Yeah, crazy. And, then, and the rest, and I think America probably dwarfs that. Um, and I just saw the amount of interest in it. And I'm going, I could see it growing in Australia over the years and it's only going to get bigger it was the thought at the time. And the content that News Corp who produced the game and still do did around it just wasn't that good. And I'm yeah. like, and I sort of sat there and went, I can get people together and do better content than this. For sure. Quite comfortably. And like they just charge so much money for people to be able to view it. Like I remember it's changed now, thank God. But you, if you wanted to access the Supercoach articles, you had to subscribe to the whole of News Daily Corp. Telegraph it was like $350 yeah. or something. I'm like, this is mad. I'm like. I can go and do better content and do it for $30 yeah. and you get a thousand people of that in my head. I'm going, there's $30,000. Like, let's go. What was the conversation like when you told 
like your manager or whoever, like you, you were going to leave? Were they like surprised? Were they happy for you? What was yeah. the reaction? It's always, you know, different hearing yeah. that story from people. So I actually like, like just prior to that sort of having that combo, uh, I was in Europe with a mate mm. and we were in Zagreb in Croatia and yeah. we were sitting out at a, at a, an outdoor sort of bar watching. It was Nadal and Nadal and Kyrgios. Not when Kyrgios beat him as a young fellow. It was another time around. So this would have been 2019. And we just sat there and, it, like, we've all got that mate who's got a wise head on their shoulder yeah. and, and you sort of trust and, yeah. you know, they're straight shooters and yeah. that was this bloke, fortunately. And, mate, we just sat there and just I told him my idea and we just churned through it for hours and hours and hours along with the rest of the trip. And then during that trip, I just decided, I'm like, right, screw it, let's go, let's let's do it. So this was probably five, six months before I left. Mm -hmm. So I had no money in my account because all the way up until this point, I would just save money and then travel, save yeah. money and travel and get down to zero and then go again. Yeah. Um, but I did have a lot that of That was leave. the play back then. Yeah. A lot of people did that. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. not that different to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I had about five months after that where I, I just plotted it all and saved my money. And I also had a heap of leave saved up as well, oh, yeah. which was great. Um, yeah, when I eventually told them and, and sat down with them, the the boss who I was telling it to, I was so nervous going in. Yeah. Hadn't had to resign from jobs too often. And, <laughs> and he just went, like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, like, you know, you're working at the Daily Telegraph, like big thing for your age. And he goes, he goes, he goes you're more than halfway to, um, your, what do you call it, yeah, 10 years, um, long service leave. You get that, I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I'm like, I'm unhappy in the job. I'll yeah. be honest. Like, you're more than half, you're halfway yeah. there. You're like, I need another five years yeah, to go. Yeah, I'm like, like, that, that was the quote. And I'm like, well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he goes, he goes, mate, give me a second. Mm -hmm. Can I go and talk to your other bosses and just can you give me a minute? Like it rattled him. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, cool. Good to know that I mean something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not that I wasn't appreciated, don't be wrong. But um, And he went and got my other bosses and spoke to them and, came back and we sort of sat down for a half hour, 40 minutes and chatted about it. And I, I spoke through it all and said the exact same things I just said to you about just lack of opportunity to play sort of sport and weekends. And I just wanted to get out and about and be a reporter and um, not in a selfish way. I was like, this is the way it works. You got to bide your time. But I was like, I was just impatient. Um, yeah. And yeah, they said, look, can you just sit on it for a week and have a think about it? Da da. We'll talk to you in a week. He said, no dramas. I'm like, yeah. I wasn't in a rush. Yeah. Came back to me in a week, asked me, I'm like, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I I don't you know, it's so hard looking back on, on, on timelines and everything. But from what I remember, I don't know if this, you know, as someone that is, is you know, this is my outlet. I, I I follow that outside of, you know, what I do with, with business and everything. You were always, I don't know if this you'd already left by then or you were still at the Daily Telegraph, but I remember like the feedback from like the viewers. Every time you were on the show, everyone was really keen. Right, everyone was really keen to see your take. Now, when it comes to turning an idea into reality, what did planning that whole move look like? Because clearly, it's like, yeah, sure, you have some long, you have some like, you know, leave saved up, and you might be able to say, look, I've got, I can pay all my bills for the next however many months. But you need to have a plan more than just the content. It needs to turn into a, a, a full, you know, livelihood for you. Like we, we're, we're here to discuss. But what did that process look like of like taking it from idea? To reality and maybe now's a good time for the people that you know aren't already across what what super coach is mm -hmm. and they see playbook you could kind of explain as you go through that what playbook is and what what super yeah. coach is for those that don't already know yeah so i suppose just off the bat super coach and fantasy <laughs> sports in general who aren't familiar with them basically you, you pick uh you pick a squad of players uh, it's a game it's a game run by news corp this particular one nrl super coach uh and you pick a squad of players from the nrl and when they play their games on the weekend and they score tries and tackle, they earn points for your team. And your team plays against everyone else who has entered their team and you play against your mates and you try and beat them and, you know, you'll have James Tedesco and then your other mate will have Dylan Edwards and James Tedesco scores a try and you hit the pub with a mate and you go, you know, stiff shit sucked in like, yeah. like 17 points. Uh, then at the end of the week, the points build up and you get your result for the week. So in a nutshell, that's sort of how it all works. Um, and yeah, how it sort of all unfolded, I, I had maybe five, 10K max in the account when I did it. And I was very fortunate and still am just have a lot of good contacts and a good mates in a lot of different industries. And 
you need probably help with this because you yeah. meet a lot of people who do different things. Uh, and even outside of that, who I lent on early on. When I did, I was like, all right, I don't have a lot of money. Low overheads, low overheads. And yeah. I thought it all out and I thought of like, where are my expenses going to be? And there wasn't much, to be honest. It was probably one of the biggest ones was getting the website up and running. Um, so if anyone sort of is not familiar with it, I've got a website with, you know, 15, 20 odd contributors, which is built up. This is, this would have been the end of 2019, start of 2020. Uh, and then the podcast network, which sort of very much built over the years, but uh, it was probably the website. And I had a, a mate of mine who was a web developer and who's still with me today. I just launched a new website and yeah. he's done all it's that. next level now. Yeah, I gotta check, it's I gotta great. Check it out. And, and he, um, Mate, he just worked for, I'd say unders, but that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. Like just mate traits and so good at what he does and, and so helpful. And um, like my cousin's an accountant who he did work for free for me in the early days and helped me out. And same thing, I had mates who were like graphic designers who helped me with the logos and all these things early on where I'm like, I couldn't afford to pay graphic, graphic sure. designs and web developers and accounts and all that. But I knew I had these and, like I, I'm probably different to other people with this, but and it's probably like my upbringing and and sort of where I come from. But in my head, like let's all just be collaborative and help each other out. And, sure. And easy to say, like where I'm now. But if someone comes to me and needs a hand with something, especially a mate, I'm like, I'm going to charge a mate to do yeah. this or that and da da. Depending on what level it is. Mm -hmm. Um. But I was very fortunate. That I had all these people who were able to help me out and. What I could afford, I'd flip me a bit of money and they'd all be very reluctant. Didn't want to tell like, mate, yeah. like you've done this much for me. And particularly my, my web fella, who's just been the best ever since day dot, I'm like, I'd give him money when I could. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky to, ha to have all these people in these positions and very uh, gifted, intelligent mates. And I spoke to the ones with business heads about it and, and got their feedback and their critical analysis and was just able to put it all together and go for broke. And see, all, all in that, like, for the, for the people listening as well, there's a massive lesson in that. So many people would let that stop them. I don't know how to build a website. I, I don't have access to all the, at the start, like you're scrappy as like when I started this business, yeah, we put all like, we say it's well report. I've talked about this in many podcasts. We saved 10 grand each, put it in like from that 10 grand each, it was like $18,000 almost was on stock. So it's like, we had like yeah. $2,000 to make a website, get some content. So it's like, you're leaning on friends for favors. Come be a part of the shoot. We'll give you your product. Can't really pay mm. you right now, but you know, you, you have to find a way at the beginning when you don't have a lot of resources it, or it's just, what's mm. the, what's the alternative? You don't do it. And as you said, like, I think, people sort of think of those expenses, but I think like I've spoken to people and say, Oh, like, I, you know, I wouldn't ask a mate to, to help me with this or do that. I'm like, never underestimate what your mates are willing to do to help you in that. Like, yeah. like think to yourself, would you help a mate if they come and ask you? And you go, absolutely. I would. And like, I'd do it for free, especially if they were starting up a business and needed yeah. and needed a couple of hours of my time to, to whip a logo together yeah, or whatever yeah. it might be. Um, Reach out and ask your mates. Like, no one cares. <laughs> Especially it's like you're asking them for their time and their skill. You're not saying, hey, can you chip in 10 grand for me? Like, exactly you know what I mean? Right. Like yeah. lean on the people around you. So what did the, the playbook look like in the early days? Because we'll talk about it in a second. We alluded to the fact that you podcast pretty much mm. every day these days. But what did like, what was the core pod? Like what was the core playbook around? It was the articles at the start. Yeah. And did you have just like the Tuesday night pod? What was the original yeah. version of SC playbook? So articles and basically in my head, I sort of thought, all right, I can build a subscription that, you know, my, the space at the time, and it's probably no different now, there was no one competing with News Corp, mm. which is why they could probably afford to charge what they were. Yeah, charge what they were and do, you know, okay content at best. Yeah. And I just sit there going like, there's no one competing against them in this industry that is clearly booming. I'm like, you see how obsessed people are that play fantasy today, myself included, and watching games. It's next level. For sure. And my other thought was that because <clears throat> I could see the subscriptions that go through News Corp and whatnot, it, they were going to continue to invest money into it. Yeah. So I'm like, sweet. They basically promote the game and then I write content on it, as News Corp do with the NRL. The NRL produced rugby league and the competition – and you just got right content on it. Same, same concept. It's like, and, and like with this as well, I'm sure it could be easy for like a, you know, a news corp to think, you know, he's going out to compete against us, mm. but it also, it's very clearly one of those rising, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Like you all make each other greater by the yeah. fact that having different competitors in an industry makes the whole industry better and attracts more people to it. Exactly. And that was one of the things I was terrified with early on. And, 
And I was up front when I did it. When I left, I said, they're like, oh, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, I'm going to put some Supercoach content together and, and see how it all goes. And they said, yep, no worries. And basically since day dot, I still write articles for the Telegraph yeah, and I still so- go onto their Supercoach show and do all those sorts of things. I'm a people pleaser. I don't like top set in that sort of sense. And um, which is why like, I was up front when I did it, when I left and said I was having a crack at it. And I think it was probably a bit of a, that was sort of looking at me laughing a little bit and just kind of like, good luck to him, but uh, let Dave, him do what he wants. Yeah. So, uh, now it's turned out well, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so originally it was the website and I just thought that I, yeah, the space, there was, just, there was a lot of amateur podcasters doing them in their own time and they did awesome jobs of it. And there was some, like, decent stuff out there, but there was no one who committed full-time mm. to taking on the content that was out there. And I'm like, well, I can be that person. So it wasn't a case of... When I did it, I didn't want to be working five days a week or three days a week and doing it on the side. I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it properly. So it's pretty ballsy to jump like fully in the mm. deep end from the start. Yeah, yeah, I was relying on a bit coming through, and unfortunately, subscriptions did enough uh, early on. As I said, there were very low overheads, and and like that's what a lot of people said like said like very risky and like a big move to do it. But the way I looked at it was that you know my parents were back in Cooma. Lovely house there. My bedroom was still there. I'm like, if this goes up shit creek and it doesn't work and I have no money, worst case, I go back home. I was obviously living in Sydney. I go back home and I sleep in my room and the oldies will cook me a meal. I'm like, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm grateful that I was in the position to do that because not everyone has, has yeah, that. Yeah, that's not, very true. Not everyone can go back to the, to the family home and, and have that bed available and feed available and be able to lean on them for, for food. And yeah. uh, again, not that I would want it to get to that, and yeah. it never did, but I had a fallback. Yeah, but I, I think as well, like not everyone does, and obviously it's a privileged position mm. to be in, to be to be in that position. As I said, I was living at home at the time as well, so it makes it easy. But I know a lot of people listening do have family that they could fall back on, and it's like people say the same thing to me when I say, you know, I put ten grand in, I had like less than a grand left to make out. Dylan, wasn't that such a risk? Like, how did you do it? It's like, you can think of it like that, but also isn't the risk, isn't the bigger risk staying in the thing that you already know isn't making you happy. Exactly. You know what I mean? You already, you've done it. You already know, like, why not take a little bet on yourself to make it happen? And then like you went and dove in the deep end and and the brilliant thing about throwing yourself in the deep end like that, you've got no choice, but sink or swim. So you bet your ass, you're going to do everything you can, right? You have to swim. Exactly. So, (laughs) and that was the beauty of it. I was like, especially because as soon as I started it and launched Playbook, I loved everything about it and I loved where I'd never, I mean, it, I was I would have been 24 or something at the time, 25 maybe. So I'd never worked for myself. So yeah. I'd been my own boss and done all that. I'd never worked from home. I, just, I loved everything about it. And I'm just going, all right, this is the best job ever. I need to make it work. Otherwise I'll be back in a corporate office somewhere working and working not necessarily big hours, but the nine to five, you know, which is all fine. But for me, not what I wanted to do. And so to now get sort of in my eyes, the dream job, I'm like, if you don't work hard enough and make this happen, what's not going to happen, is it? So. Yeah, exactly. But like, and and for you, you like the way you executed it and, and everything, obviously it was great. It worked from the first time, but if it didn't, you know, maybe you have to move home, you regroup, you figure out another plan and you try again. Mm. Right. You're never going to succeed unless you try. And like, I'm like a big believer and a big advocate. Like we get one life, like decide what, like, and this is why when when people come to me and I do mentoring with people and they're trying to figure out, like, I know I want to do something for myself, um, but like, I don't know what business I would start or what I would do. And what I get people to, 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 to ask themselves is like, like if you are like, let's just say you won a lot of hundred million dollars, you never have to work again for the rest of your life. Sure. You go, you do your year traveling, blah, blah, blah. You do all that stuff. It's like, what would you be happy to do with your time for free? Like, what would you do for free? And there's always something, oh, I would do this. And like, I do, you know, the podcast is something you'd, you'd be more than happy to do for free. And it's like, so figure out a way to make that your job. And like, okay, is that even possible? There's so many examples now of like, yes, that is. And if you look at like kind of the way you've modeled it, we're talking about your specific niche because that's what you've done. But like you pick a big masterpiece of content, whether it be a sport, whether it be Star Wars, whether it be Lego, whatever, you can turn whatever you're interested in into in one way, shape or form a business in your life. It's that whole, I don't know if you're, you know much about him, but the whole Gary Vee thing, that's what he talks about as well. And I just think we live in 2024 you know, these beautiful machines, like you can start businesses, you can start podcast, you do everything from these. There is really no excuse anymore 
Um, and then it's like, once you start, like, I'm sure when you launched, you know, day one, you didn't have the exact vision of where you would be sitting today. Like you just need to start and then things start to figure themselves out step by step. Um, but I want to know for the people that are listening and they're like, okay, you know, like I really respect the journey that Tim's gone on and what he's done. I want to do it for myself in whatever chosen, you know, interest I have. When it comes to like, you know, the business sense of it. And uh, before we talk about the business kind of side of things, I want to preface as well. I mentioned earlier on, like, you've got a really good loyal community. And one thing as well, like the subscription you're talking about is $40 for a whole season. Like if you're going to be, you know, charging a subscription or you're monetizing your audience over delivering on the value is really important. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I'm sure if you asked anyone in the, in the WhatsApp group, you know, are you happy with your 40 bucks? Not one person is going to say, no, I'm not. Um, so that's really important. But like, what are the avenues available when you go out and you start creating, whether it be a website or a podcast and you've turned into like this whole podcast, like household, like holding multiple podcasts a week, what are the ways in which that can monetize? So you've got the WhatsApp way. Well, maybe we can start with like the WhatsApp sort yeah. of subscriber group. So subscription, when I first launched was the idea. And again, I was going <clears throat> complete. I was, I was experienced five years, call it what it is. Mm. I was relatively experienced in journalism and writing, putting articles together. Yeah putting those articles on social media, which I thought I was experienced at, but now you work with gun content creators. Yeah. I'm like, no, I had no idea. <laughs> so I had no business experience behind me or, or anything. Um, so monetizing it was purely based on the subscription of News Corp and what I was looking to charge. And as I said, I think I alluded to it earlier, but I thought, all right, if I can start things off at $30 and get a thousand people, I think at the time there was about 150,000 playing super coach. And I went, mean, if I can get a thousand people to do it, that's 30,000. Yep. I'm like that's a pretty decent start for for year one, and I can't remember what year one was. I was probably around about, along with maybe a little bit of advertising, not a lot, but a little bit. I was probably that thirty to forty thousand. Yeah, and then it just sort of gradually got higher each year. But I've now sort of developed different revenue streams, and the podcast network has now and advertising through that has become number one. Yeah, uh, which has sort of gone over subscriptions now, which are still going well, but it's about you know, now I'm doing what there's five or six podcasts in the SC Playbook Network. With every listener you get through each of them, ads go into it, all different sorts of things. So um like yeah, I'm just trying to think like there's And like on terms of, well, yeah. I I can speak to this as well because I've I watch yeah. it, I listen to all your shit. Like and it seems like as well, we don't do any podcast we don't even do any sponsors for this podcast because I sponsor it myself, my business. Yeah. I'm in, in that position to kind of, you know, it work, works really well for me. Um but so you've got some, like, let's just say someone starts a podcast on whatever topic you can just subscribe to like, you know, the Acast, whatever they can get you sponsors. Mm. And there's ones where, you know, they can, you know, your, whether it be Acast or some other like media platform that's, that's doing this for you, you can go and just, you know, source random podcasts read by some random person, whether it be halfway through at the end of your episode, whatever it may be. And then there's like proper partnerships like you have with um, Blue Wealth Property as well yeah. that you guys, so there's a couple of different types of yeah. ways that you can do that, right? So the first, this is the first year I linked with ACAST and an agency and okay. I always used to do my own deals. Yeah. Was that a good move, do you feel? Uh, yes. Like it just took a lot of time okay. to do these deals and yeah. and I'd spend a lot of time speaking to, you know, bookmakers or, you know, whoever it might be and it'd be ongoing for like a month or two and then it'd fall through the last hurdle and you just go, I've spent so much time I could have been doing content or building yeah. other areas of the business where I've just like, and it was profitable certainly yeah, for a few years and I think it's a good uh, probably sign that advertising works through Playbook because I've got a, a mob mortgage choice who I've had on basically since I think year two or something who have been on and, you know, I, all plans are going well will be on next year, four, five, six yep. years later sort of thing. Blue Wealth Property have been on for I think it's the third year now. Um, Quantium, a data analytics mob, they've been with us for years and years and I've just been able to sort of build the relationships, which is great. It just got to a point this year where it was just taking up so much of my time and because in particular the the podcast network expanded so very quickly in <laughs> yeah. the last two years, yeah. that took up a lot of time and I just went, I can't spend my days doing these meetings and talking to people and trying to broker these deals when I need to be doing podcasts, it's and it good. Just took it's, so much out of me. Yeah, it's a very white collar version of getting yourself off the tools. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like you become the product at the end of the day, and yeah. that's a big part of 
the success that you guys have had, like you being the product now, <clears throat> again, people like that's a really like high level overview of like how it works. And like, there are some people like if you can create a big podcast, if you are doing like say three to five episodes a week on, on different things and you have like a, a, a pre roll, a mid roll and an end roll, you can make some really good money off that from like these businesses, which the money's only starting to come into podcasting. And it's like, it's crazy how powerful podcasting is because the people that are listening, they listen nearly every week to you. So it's like, you have a really strong connection there. So if you can create a community around whatever interest, and then it gets big enough that sponsors are interested in sponsoring you, it's a win-win. It really yeah. is a win-win. So it's really exciting. And but yeah. So I was saying, and that's where like my priority and my focus has become the podcast. And like, I still do writing for the website each week, but <clears throat> I've been able to employ someone the last two seasons off the back uh, of the increased numbers. And like my goal and, and hopefully in the next year or two is just just to keep putting a few people on yeah. so that I put all my attention to the podcast because the the busier the bigger it gets, the busier I get. Mm -hmm. And the more admin stuff I'm doing <laughs> and, and you know, speaking with different whether it's companies or doing other gigs, at the end of the day, it's only gonna detract from the quality of the podcast because I'm more tired or I'm running out of steam or the voice is going out or something. So even like this year I've had um, a fellow come on and he's been outstanding and just a social media expert. Yep. So he's been able to do a lot of the, the socials for me and I haven't had to worry about that, which is not never has been my strong point yeah. on Mark. So I've had more time to worry about, you know, writing an article here or there or, or doing the podcast. And that's hopefully where we'll end up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like, and that, like that journey as well, it's like, it, it even inspires me and I know it'll inspire people listening. It's like, you go from like, okay, you quit your job, you're doing everything yourself and then it gets a little bit bigger and then you can start to bring other people in to support the journey until it gets to the point, like what you're doing, like what Denon's doing, you're just like the face of this content. And like, that's like the best, like for me anyway, I, I really relate to you guys because sport just happens to be one of the things I'm also really interested about. But could you imagine for like just at home listening, like the thing you love most, your job is to talk about that every day. Mm. Just talking about the thing you love, analyzing it, speaking it, doing some research, you'll really feel like you'll never work again. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the most powerful stuff. But I want to talk about the journey of growing uh, the SC Playbook. So when you launched, you had, was it just the Tuesday podcast? Like yeah, just one, one podcast. One podcast a week. And very quickly, like you said, over the last mm. couple of years, there's now a podcast, <clears throat> like four or five podcasts a week. What did that journey look like of increasing the amount yeah. of shows you put on? So when I launched Playbook, I I hadn't really had any major idea to do a podcast. I was like, I'll do one on the side just to add a bit more value and, you know, try and create something out of it. But genuinely in my head, I was like, no one's going to want to listen to me. Like I'd, I'd done podcasting at – at News Corp and I, don't know, I guess it went all right, but I listened back to myself. I'm like, this is terrible. Like why I couldn't get through my head. Why would anyone want to listen to you? And kicked it off and it went well. And mate, I, I spent nights and nights. I was so, so paranoid about, because I knew I was doing it from such an amateur perspective and I wanted to be professional about getting it right. Mm -hmm. So like I'd do it on a, a, like an online production studio sort of thing. And yeah. I'd have, other people on the podcast call in and because there's a, such a finite amount of time for my listeners to listen to my podcast, like people can listen to your podcast and they can be relevant in three years time. hundred percent. Yeah. Whereas my ones, <clears throat> rugby league teams for the round drop 4 PM on Tuesday, the round starts 8 PM Thursday. It's a pretty small window and I have to jam all the content I can <laughs> out there in that time to give people time to listen to it, to get their teams and their trades sorted for essentially by Thursday night because by Friday morning, no one's really going to be listening to those episodes. So when I first started it, and I again, I didn't have any audio, audio editing background and, or knowledge, so I had to learn it all off cuff. So the recording would screw up, so then I'd be waiting from this program that I was using and their people that work for them were in the Philippines, so they'd be offline until like 3 a.m. So I'd be up at 3 a.m. in the morning editing it, getting what they'd done and, and fixed bits up for me because I wanted to release it by like yeah. 5.30 for the commuters the Wednesday morning. Um, anyway, I would then go on to meet Guru uh, about two years down the track. I know you've podcasted with yeah. before and had him on the show. And I knew like my numbers were decent enough and I was starting to, you know, make – again, because I didn't work with like an agency like Acast, <clears throat> I was kind of guessing everything. I'm like – 
I'd go to advertise, hey, look, I'm getting this many listens. We can put your ads on this, da, da, da. And Guru reached out to me and goes, oh, mate, uh, I love what you do. I want to expand some of my Supercoach staff onto a show with you. And I go, whatever. And he goes, do you want to get a beer and have a chat about it? And I'm like, yeah, mate, let's go for it. And I go, oh, here we go. Like this, this is that bloke that puts his, puts his hand to the camera and looks at himself and da, 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 oh. which I now do thanks to Guru because <laughs> he, he was so far ahead of the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he sat down and – we had a beer and he goes, mate, oh, you have to answer, but do you mind um, telling me how many listens you get? And I think at that time I was maybe getting 7,000 listens an episode or something. And he goes, you're kidding me, are you? I'm like, no. I'm like, I was like, is that good? Yeah, you didn't and even know. No, I, I was like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Um, and he goes, mate, that's unreal. And and Guru started, obviously Guru's podcast model is very different to what yeah. anyone's is. He's like mass um, production. Yeah. And he goes, mate – come to a show with me, put it together. And he started sort of dropping a few figures of, you know, what I could be earning off the back of the numbers that I'm doing. And if I expand my network and that, so I'm very grateful to guru. Yeah. Just opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had never even considered. Um, so from there, I just started one show became two, became three, became four. Mm. And now we're at five or six a week or something. And yeah, with, with everyone that gets added, the numbers hold up. So it's, it's yeah. obviously a good sign. I actually um, found Guru through you. Like I was listening to, to Playbook before I even knew who Guru yeah. was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, better, you, you have to let him know. But I yeah. want to as well, because I like, it's fun to talk about, you know, all the exciting things and all the inspirational things. But, you know, I'm very conscious with business as well about like being realistic about the work that really goes into it. Now, obviously you've got all those shows, but Talk me through an average week, not just the shows you're doing. I just want to paint the picture of like the preparation because obviously I've got a podcast. Mm. We know before and after a podcast, that's where the work is. When you're actually recording the podcast, that's the easy part, easy. right? What's your week look like in terms of the amount of work that go, goes into it? Just so people, if they're, you know, thinking about, I want to make one on whatever, they can kind of start to realize what taking it to a bigger level will look like in the future. Yeah. And I suppose if we're talking podcast specifically, Again, when I launched, I wanted to be professional. I didn't want to seem amateur. So, you know, I had learned from sort of a few people at News Corp who'd done podcasting, but again, they were still well behind the eight ball. Like this has started 2020. So the pod- podcasts, they were getting there, but like yeah. they've exploded since COVID really. Yeah. Um, I feel like my, ch- my main podcast of a Tuesday night, the SC Paper podcast, I'll just do a lot of – same as you. I have a Word document with probably four pages worth of how the show is going to run uh, and all the stats lined up on and all ready to go. And I have that written up each week. Uh, I do. So that's Tuesday night. Tuesday how long do you think that prep takes you? So what I do is, so putting the doc together, it's probably 40 minutes. But what I do, I do on the SC Paperwork website, when the team shop at 4 p.m., I've got pre-written about 4,000 words of analysis. Yeah. So that is my study for the show each week. Mm -hmm. And I also do an article for the Telegraph of a Monday morning, which I sort of have written Sunday night, which is team news for the week. Yeah. So between team news and then doing my Supercoach analysis for every team, that goes into the first Supercoach podcast of the week and I'm just good to go. Like it is all there. Yeah. And there's times where I'm like that the article probably takes me two to two and a half hours to write. Uh, I could pawn this off and free up so much time. Like, no, no, like this is your ammo for the week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't really need to look at anything for the rest of the week. Yeah. So that's Tuesday night. I sort of leave the, the bloke studios about nine of a Tuesday night when that's done. Wednesday morning is the podcast with Guru. We use his studio for that now. We use bloke studios last year and that's that's been great as well. So again, I, I'm kind of, we we both do a bit of a run sheet for that together. Not too bad, but I do a bit of a deeper dive into five or six certain stats for that show, which again, I've generally got sorted from my analysis the day before. Um, I then have a punting podcast of a Thursday morning. So I need to put that run sheet together. You got to research what you think would be. Yeah. Could be good and and that's a very different angle to super coach. So I don't yeah. have a super coach in mind when I do that. That's looking at things like, all right, basically the likelihood of players scoring and teams winning and all that sort of stuff. So completely different sort of area of um, research for, for NRL. So do the research for that one, do that show. And like I still produce and put all my podcasts out myself. Yep. Um, certainly the ones from home as well. And then I do another one, like a Q and A of a Thursday. So that was a really good addition. And t- talking about like the value <clears throat> add from like a, you know, a listener, a subscriber, <clears throat> such a good addition as well. And takes you like out, like it's pretty, yeah. like that one was like, 
You just you don't even have to prep. You go, you read what people say, you talk off the cuff. And right? again, credit when credit due, I was like, first year or so of it, I was replying in the WhatsApp group to all the subscribers and sitting there typing away. And it did take me, you know, two, three minutes to to write something to one question. Yeah. Guru goes, voice record it and put it in a podcast. Yeah. And then it's another show. I'm like, doy. <laughs> um, yeah. And again, the numbers been good for it. And I get through heaps more questions. It's yep. a value add to, to the whole thing because it's subscriber only questions. And I'll still jump in and sort of try to speak to, to the subscribers and, and do bits as well. But yeah, so there's a lot that goes into it. And and even now, because I do the bloke in a bar podcast of a Monday, like when I left the telly, I probably should have said this earlier, but in my head, I was going, all right, if I make a fist of this, super coach is essentially a Monday to Friday job because super coach, the game unlocks at the end of a round of a Monday morning. And then people start doing their trades and changing their teams and doing all that. As I said before, by Thursday night, the round begins. There's not much I can do. So Friday's my admin day. I do my invoicing, all the back end stuff, all the website stuff. Of a weekend, teams can't really do trades. Their teams are locked in. The games are on. You can do content around the games yeah. through social media, which I'm getting better at and starting to do more of. But there's no real work involved. I can go hard Monday to Friday, and basically. I reckon I am one of the only sport journalists in the world who can work on Monday to Friday. How good. <clears throat> which is the best. And then the Bloke in a Bar podcast came in, which is four and a half hours of a Monday, and we analyze every game for about 45 minutes. So now I sort of am watching the games and putting notes in my phone and making sure I'm loaded with ammo going into the Monday <laughs> yeah. podcast. So that has changed things a bit, but all for the better. We uh, we had Denon on not too long ago, maybe mm. like two, three months ago, and I asked him about building out his team. He broke like, YouTube. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like from it, like from your perspective, how did that happen? And like, because when when we had Denon on, um, like I think he must have only recently brought Hammy on, and I wasn't as familiar with with Hammy as and yourself as Guru. But now I've as you know, I can't, like it's a long podcast. I can't listen to four and a half hours. I <laughs> run multiple businesses. Listen to the time. doggies and move on. Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, so like now, you know, you, I listen to bits and like, I've really like really started to enjoy Hammy as a like an addition yeah. to the team. It's just so fucking funny. Uh, and like his takes are hilarious, but how did that opportunity come up for you? Like, did he just send you a message one day? Like, how did that sort of come up? Uh, Guru again, oh, Guru, yeah. Guru put me forward. So Guru started, I'm going to say November-ish the year before. It might've been earlier that year. And then there'd been an opening. It was because it was just Guru and Kempi for a while. I think Shandor Earl was on before me and he'd left. He's a legend as well. Yeah. Great man. Uh, and Guru said to Kempi, he goes, mate, I, I do a super good show with this bloke and gave me good raps. I said, he knows his footy and that sort of thing. And mate, I don't know what Kempi's reaction was, yeah. but obviously Guru convinced him enough to, to give me a crack. So I went in there one day. Or Guru said, mate, do you want to come on the Bloke in the Bar podcast? I'm like, sure, why not? And yeah, it was a little bit different for me because I have just been not always super coach, but for the three, three and a half or so years leading to that point, I'd been all super coach. So you do have to look at it in a different mindset, straight NRL analysis than super coach. Anyway, I went on and went, all right, let's see how this goes. Guru goes, be prepared. Like it'll be three and a half, four hours. And I'm like, okay, noted. So, <laughs> so I got myself prepared and mate, for the first five, six, seven, probably weeks, I didn't really hear from Kempi. I just come in and, and do the show and I, it'd be like Sunday night and I had all my notes ready to go, but I'd be like, Hey mate, do you know if I'm on or not? And he goes, Guru just keeps saying, mate, until you hear differently, just, just keep turning up. up. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And, um, you've been doing it for a while now, right? A year and a half, yeah, two years uh, or so. This will be three years. Three years, yeah, wow. Yeah, this is third year. So end of the season will be three seasons. And that just happened, yeah, very organically. And so I just kept showing up and obviously did something well enough to, to yeah. keep the gig. And that changed things um, dramatically, probably just the way my week looked because that, that's like a whole Monday and you're prepping all weekend and prepping Sunday nights. What, again, this is a slap me moment where you go, Prepping, mate. You watch footy you games. Watch and footy, take you notes. poor it's bastard. Like, yeah. God, life's tough. So I'm you, working on a weekend. Are so. you like as you're watching? Are you writing notes as you're watching? Or yeah. yeah so you, it's like yeah, okay. big, big, long, long winded notes sort of thing. And yeah. I sit there with my partner, and she want to watch a movie. And I'm like, so, it'll, it'll be the Titans and the Tigers. And I'm like, 
sorry, I've got to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and was there, because obviously like as well, talk about pinch me moments, like you're now on like, I would say, I mean, I don't know everyone's numbers, but I would say pretty comfortably the biggest like sports show in the country, like definitely the biggest NRL show in the country. And you're just like, yeah, that kid from Kuma, like, yeah, sure. Your brother played first grade, but now you're literally in like, can be really easy for people to look at like, okay, the people on Fox or nine, but it's like independent media has grown to like rival that. If not, like, I'm sure like you'd look at, look at like this, like the playbook versus the code sports, like their super coach show. I'm guaranteed that the SC playbook is getting a lot more listens than that. Yeah. But did you get like a bit of a, okay, bump then? Cause you're now being exposed to so many other people who obviously watching Bloken and Bar, they're just in it for the actual footy, the rugby league, not so much super coach. Did you notice after being on there for a while, maybe that started to build SC Playbooks listenership as well, just being exposed to a larger audience? certainly helped, but like not enormously. Like it said, the numbers are already, I think um, Playbook had quite a good share of the market leading into that anyway. So the numbers, they certainly had an uptick, but it's hard to know because what am I, maybe five years into Playbook now and it's sort of, Growing each the organic year, growth anyway. the organic growth. So I don't really know whether it's going to trend or how much the bloke show helped. It certainly helped the social media accounts though, mm-hmm. and, and Instagram in particular, and doing stuff with uh, like Guru with his massive social following and Kempy's yeah. social following, and Kempy's awesome on the show. Like he'll always plug our. You know, if we've got a new website up or if we're doing new ventures or new bits and pieces, you know, he'll always give them great plugs. And you know, I say, you know, get on and give SC Playbook a follow, and that's going out to. You know, thousands of people. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely, it certainly helped. Yeah. And that's the, that's the cool thing as well. Like speaking about like, I feel like the way Denon is so, like so generous with his time mm. and he's like, let's use the studio, come in. Like I was chatting for half an hour before the podcast, like just talking to him. I was like, just so generous in terms of like giving people opportunities. And I think like, goes back to that, like a rising tide lifts all boats. You guys have also made his show so much better and now everything that, that um, has come from that. But you mentioned the point of like, okay, you, you've been watching your footy or at least the way like you would write your notes or analyze the game is very super coach focused. Do you ever, does it ever muddy the water? Is it, or is you kind of used to it now? Like, is it different analyzing it from a rugby league perspective and trying to not be so super coach influenced when you're talking about your analysis or? Uh, it is. But I'm pretty good at keeping my heart and bias out of my analysis. Like yeah, even yeah. like I'm a Canberra Raiders fan and, and we'll do our tips on the bloke in a bar show each week. Obviously direct rugby league analysis, no super coach related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll tip against the Raiders and I'll say the Raiders are going to get belt and the boys blow up and they're like, oh, show some heart. And, that. and I'm like, people don't listen to me for heart. I'm like, they're here <laughs> because in theory I know something about rugby league. So yeah. it doesn't matter. It, it, it actually helps it a lot because – I probably watch rugby league different to most analysts out there because I go through a super coach lens that's very data-based and very yeah. statistical. And I do so much research for super coach that I think the average uh, analyst probably wouldn't do. Mm-hmm. It's not to say I know more than him. I just, I do look at it in probably different ways to the average, just straight rugby league watcher. Yeah. Well, um, we'll talk a bit of footy and super coach in, 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 a, in a sec, but one thing I just, would ask before we move on to some of that stuff as someone that's been able to build this like content machine that you have and, you know, got it to the position where like, you know, you don't have to work anymore outside of this, like a dream for so many people. What would be like your advice for people that are thinking about starting their own, you know, let's just say something as simple as a podcast or a YouTube channel or a blog. What would your advice be to people that are considering it and they know they really want to do something? Ask for help, honestly. And I've just, I just feed off the people around me and all their, their expertise. And I just ask questions and ask yeah. questions. And, you know, you say like, uh, has playbook grown and listenership and that sort of thing since joining bloke in a bar. I don't think being on the show as such has helped it tremendously, like a, a massive spike in numbers, but being able to be around these content wizards like Guru and Kempi and, and even Maddie the water boy, He's a legend too. <laughs> He's the best. And my, I just pick their brain on everything. And yeah. like, I suck at social media. I don't really enjoy social media that much. I'm like, I love the WhatsApp group that we have because yeah. it's direct and it's um, personable and I can chat to people. Social media stuff, I'm just like, I'm on it every day for so long, but I'm not very good at it. Whereas Kempi Goo, they're superstars at it. Yeah, yeah, that's their thing. So I just sit there. Like I remember I would have been last season, probably the season before I sat down with I go, Guru, mate, could I have an hour of your time or some point? 
just to chat through and, and run through my socials and get your feedback. And uh, no, he we sat there for like like Guru and I are best mates now, and we yeah. were good mates then. But we sat there for like four hours in his kitchen, and just he just helped me review everything I did. And he go, mate, this is shit. This is shit. This is shit. I'm like, sweet, bang. Yeah. And like anything, don't get upset by constructive criticism. Like take it on board. I hate. When I ask for feedback from people, I hate when people are positive. I'm like, it's not going to help me. I'm yeah, like, yeah, thank yeah. you for considering my feelings, but <laughs> but be critical and you like, need to, you need to know. it hurts. So, and mate, Kempy's the same. Like, I'll do, I'll do new logos, or I'll look at doing to start looking at a bit of merch. These blokes have done it all before, like yeah. for, for years, and we all have our own um, attributes that have made each brand work well. But together, you can just. Um, work with each other and I've learned so much. So my advice would literally be just whatever industry you get into and where something you're not sure of, just ask, you're going to know someone roughly in that industry. Just ask them. hundred percent. Like success leaves clues and like, it, like the easiest way to get forward, like to where you want to be is surround yourself by with people that have done it or mm. ask them questions. You know, there's just so many different ways, you know, we can go about that today and I just think like and I try and encourage people so much don't stay in a situation you're not happy with you do have more control um over your life and your destiny than you think but on the on the on the while we're talking about the Rue thing obviously launched Patreon really successfully recently is that something you would consider or, or do you prefer the subscriber model that you've got now same thing much of a much like, really like I'll I'll look to tweak uh, my subscription model over the years and again I'm just I'm learning on my feet mm. when I started it I didn't want it to be too expensive and People like hit me up and like, mate, can we donate more? Like what you give is way more than, is. than what we pay in that. And I'm like, yeah, sure. It, like it, it probably is. And like I put in a lot of time to it. I feel I've got some expertise certainly around sort of super coach and that. Yeah. But you don't want to price people out of it. For sure. For starters, like I said, well, I've got such a great community of, of, of they're, they're just good people and everyone so collaborative and everyone gets along and you don't want to shut people out and, Basically, in my head and from a business head, if I can continue to grow my podcast listenership, the advertising comes with that and I won't have to sort of increase subscriptions too much. So certainly I've been doing it minor tweaks, but yeah. it doesn't need to be anything major. So like. what does the future look like if we talk about, because at the men- at, at the beginning of the podcast, I kind of preface, like you look over the last five years, collectibles, trading cards, every, or like this, a lot of subcultures have really started to grow in fantasy sport. In America, it's probably been big the last 10, 15 years, but it's starting to come, you know, to, to Australia. I know, obviously, we've mainly been talking about, like, the rugby league super coach because that's kind of the main yep. thing you do, but you also do the BBL cricket. What, like, what do you see the future for SC Playbook over the next five years? Can you, like, you're already doing five shows a week. Mm. Can you continue to grow and add? Like, do you have a plan of, like, what else you could bring into it in the future, different sports or different styles of content? Yeah, so from day dot when I launched it, I wanted SC Playbook to – whether it takes five years, 10 years, 20 years, be like an all-encompassing fantasy sport network mm. and cover all the, all the big ones, yep. footy, cricket, AFL, um, expand internationally and do NBA, do EPL. That's still the plan, but I think at the time when I had that vision, I probably didn't realise how profitable it could be, Yeah, at least not this early on. And now like I'm seeing the results from the NRL and I'm going, all right, like we've got an AFL um, channel as well yep. that does a, just one podcast and had articles last couple of years, but and it was on the website, but I've sort of pulled back on that because I'm just like, because of how quickly NRL is risen, I'm like, yeah. oh, I need to capitalise on that yeah, yeah, so yeah. that I can grow for the future. So yeah. just sort of keeping the AFL ticking over, but not a big priority by any means at the moment. Yeah. The cricket does well, but in a shorter time frame. Like Two-month season, three-month season. <laughs> yeah, maybe. so – that's the next major goal and that is expanding cricket. And it's a little bit hard in terms of the fantasy sports side of things, the BBL's two months max. So I probably want to – the plan there is to expand that over the next 12 months quite substantially and make it year-round. Do you know in terms of like players, like not SC Playbook, like actual super coach players, what the difference in numbers is between like BBL and NRL? NRL's about 160. Uh, BBL's about – Anywhere from fifty to sixty, so it's still got a pretty good yeah. base there. For me, like, I, like I still play cricket um, on the weekends. Um, fuck, it was like I just, you know, I did the thing everyone does. You get seventeen, eighteen. You now your weekends you want to go out. Stop playing sport for ages. Then I realized one day, dude, I look back like I love sport. Like I, yeah. I like playing sport is like nothing else. It's like meditation because like once you're there, you're on the field. Like it's like you're in. So I started playing sport again, um, and it's like 
I play super coach in the winter for footy. I'm like, there's no fucking way I'm doing it to myself. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. no way I'm doing it to myself. Yeah. Um, for another sport, it's just too we'll much. Get, it's we'll all, get you. Yeah, we'll get you. It's, it's all <laughs> encompassing. Um, but yeah, so there's a there's a future beyond just what it is now. But there's a lesson in that. Like, yeah, you didn't re- probably realize how big of an industry just the one like NRL super coach could be. Yeah, and it and it's like I said that the immediate plan is just to build cricket to be 12 months round. Yeah. Um, see how things are going with AFL, but what I've learned and probably again, why the NRL has gone well is because I devoted my full time to it. If you want to do it properly, you need a full time person mm. to do the sport because you can do content after a day's work and it's all good and well. But if you really want to capitalize on it, you need someone like the AFL content we've done has been great. And like the contributors I've got for that are, are awesome. But just to have people like pumping the social media content yeah. out for and just going and going and going, uh, it's hard. So Hopefully down the track, the bigger it builds, I can just put people on to run sports and yeah. do that. But yeah, sort of capitalize on footy and and expand cricket because again, cricket's a, a big passion of mine as well. So I want to do that as well. Do you have podcasts for cricket or is it just the articles? Yeah, I got the podcast as the well. Podcast and then going. same it does really well across the summer. Yeah. And at the back end of last summer, uh, with Hammy from Bloke in a Bar and Maxie Bryden, who does a lot of yeah. cricket stuff, uh sorry, footy stuff with us as well, started a general cricket podcast and, and the plan was to do that. Under all SC this Playbook. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not looking at the channel in in summer because I'd listen to that. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So it's same channel, yeah. yeah. And as I said, the numbers are really good on it. Um, but obviously over the summer, super great specific. But we launched like the Cricketers Playbook podcast, mm-hmm. which was a general cricket podcast. Yeah. I wanted to be doing that weekly across the whole year, but footy season started. And I'm like, this is so it's unsustainable. Much, right? So yeah. again, if I can get more people on deck, I can then go and said focus on the podcast and get that going. Yeah. But, but that I want to become 12 months round by sort of October. Because I was going to say, like, do you have much of an off season? Like when the footy season ends, do you get like a month or two where things can chill out a little bit and then you can yeah. start ramping up for the next I season? I get October, which I basically take off. So yeah, it's yeah. a late grand final this year, unfortunately, October <laughs> 6 or something. So I like that <laughs> kills a bit a couple of days. Because <laughs> yeah. I look to get the cricket going by November. Yeah. So the last few years I've just – I basically just take – um, October off mm. and just shut the laptop. Yeah. November leading into the Big Bash pre, uh, which is the Big Bash preseason, it's chilled out. Yeah. And like I can work remotely. So I can go back to Cooma and, and stay at mum's or I can go on holidays places. Yeah. And do work while I'm there or take the microphone and do podcasts while I'm there. Not ideal, but it's fine. It works. Yeah. And I don't feel like I'm working when I'm, when I'm away somewhere and I'm doing a bit of work on the laptop. Yeah. Um, so November's chilled out, then it's sort of all systems go from start of December when the Big Bash starts, but mainly October. Because it's like <clears> even <throat> like whenever they open Supercoach again for the next year, January or February, whatever it is, like people are onto it so quickly straight away. Yeah. Like they're waiting for opening day. So it's like the off season and leading up where you start putting up the articles and the analysis and, you know, potential cheapies and whatnot to look out for. It starts really early. Um, so just interesting to kind of understand your world. Speaking of Maxi, by the way, first you're playing draft. Do you play draft? Have you ever, like, do you play draft? I or used not? to. I do not anymore. Time constraints. I'm like, oh. I, just, I just don't have it. And, and I yeah. love the draft concept. I love it. Yeah. It, it's great. I just, I do not have the time to put into another team. Like the waiver, <laughs> the waiver wire is open and I'll be preoccupied with getting, because like they open at, what is it, 3 a.m. Wednesday 4 morning. It's 4 a.m. Yeah. And so I'm, like my Tuesday, I'm in the I'm in the studio till about nine nine thirty at night, and then I drive drive back home, and I'm then back around here for the Beers and Break Heavens podcast, which I'm at Guru Studio at eight in the morning, so it's an hour drive in. So all that's around when the yeah. waivers are opening up, and again because it comes back to me, I'm so competitive and I want to win yeah. stuff. If I miss someone on the wires because it slipped my mind or whatever, that pisses me off. So I'm like, I just I can't do it all. You know what? That's the one thing because um, I'm doing drive for the first time with a, with, with a bunch of the boys from cricket, mm. and I'm I'm really loving it. But that's the one thing I'd like. That's the one thing like that I haven't enjoyed about it at times because obviously I'm really busy with 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 business and everything, and it's like. You know, if let's say I'm really busy Tuesday and I don't have time to listen to the podcast until, you know, I'm doing my thing in the morning on Wednesday. Like, no, you have to put them in by Tuesday yeah. night. And sometimes, like, I'll be talking to my missus and she just laughs. She's like, I'm like, fuck. She's like, well, I'm like, I've got to put my, like, my waivers yeah. in. She's like, what do you mean? Like, isn't that just the game? Like, no, you don't understand. If I don't do this, the whole year is ruined. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's it. Like, from 4 p.m. when the teams drop Tuesday till I finish that podcast and get it out at 9 ish, that's like, that's my busiest window of the week. Yeah. 
So then like when I was playing two years ago, I, I didn't play last season. I think I might have played the season before. And I have my list of things to do. And at the bottom of it is like draft waiver. So I'd be in bed at 10.30 at night and I'm checking the waivers. I'm like, I don't need this. Yeah, and it's like first, <laughs> your first thing you wake up in the morning, did I get them? Like yeah, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not good. You the know, concept is great though. Yeah, like it's, you know what? I think it is really good for me because if I didn't have something like that, I would just work all the time. And like, it's, a, I feel like it's good for me to have my brain thinking about other things other than work at, at all times. But, um, but yeah, really interesting. And Maxi, by the way, I was going to say such a legend in the group. Like the he best. runs the drive chat. He's the, everyone that posts something is like, Hey Maxi, can you tell me what you think? And he's always in there. If I can really good crew of people you got is the contributors as well. So just want to say that as well. Um, we'll wrap up soon, but just on some footy stuff as well. Um, we're talking about under 19's origin last night. what do you think? Who are the standouts for you? There's a couple there, and thankfully one dear to my heart, Chevy Stewart, because he's the uh, Raiders fullback, hopefully for the next 15 years. Yeah. Uh, he was outstanding. and But the one, mate, dear to your heart, Mitchie Woods, Woods is going to be something very special. Yeah. <clears throat> and that- I, I'd heard a lot about him leading into this year, so I've kept a bit of an eye on him. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, there are a lot of people saying, like, the best, you know, young half – in the game is like a Lockie Galvin. And then I've heard people within the dogs going, no, 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 we've got the best young half. Yeah. In the game. His name's Mitch Woods. And I think they're saying, it might have been Goose. And I think he got like men in the match, maybe a Harold Matt's grand final in 16s, and then an 18s grand final, or something like that, or best player. Mate, he's a star. He's, he's a gun. Like Chevy. Um, obviously I think he's a year older than Mitch. Like he just looked above the level now. <laughs> like he's just like, got, I, I've played like yeah. a few NRL games. He was just charging I'm better through than it. You boys. Like, <laughs> and fair enough. Like, could you like go from NRL to, to, to cup is one thing, but then to go back against playing <sighs> against kids, he just must walk out with so much confidence and just be like, I'm yeah. fucking going to rip and Imagine tear. beelining it like Nelson off a solo <laughs> and then come back to this and, and seeing blokes like your size going, nah, I've got you. I was really impressed with the standard of that game. Mm. It was really entertaining. And I think again, and Mitch Woods, um, like, and obviously like experienced people around the game, like Gus, for, for, for example, you don't like putting comparisons on these young mm. players, but I, I was re- obviously saw all the plaudits about Mitch and wanted to do a little bit of research as a, as a massive doggies fan. And Gus is like, even himself, this was quite early in the year. Like, you know, I hate to do this, but just the truth, he really reminds me of like a, of like a Mortimer and the way he yeah, played the yeah. game. And it's like, he's like, you don't usually say these things to me personally. The, I, this is the first time I'd watched him outside of highlights. Like, no, I'm not Guru. I'm not watching Harold Matson and, and and whatnot. But a lot of his game genuinely reminded me quite a bit of Nathan Cleary as well. Yeah. And my question to you, like you're looking at the Bulldogs team as an ex Bulldogs fan, by the way. Mm, I can't believe. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I get it. Your brother played yeah. for him. It's fair enough. But as an ex Bulldogs fan, you look at kind of the way things are building on and off the field with the players we have now. Sexton's been really good, and I was like, couldn't but like couldn't believe it took him so long to to, to get the first grade start. Which, um, you know what I think patience really paid off in having him spend that time in reserve grade. But the one position we look at that we probably need to really take us to the level of hopefully this year we can make the eight. That'll be like, as a Bulldogs fan, it's been a long time since we've made the eight, but we probably need a really good seven. Do you see like in the next five years, Bulldogs with Mitch Woods as a halfback being able to compete for a premiership? Definitely. I mean, I I thought they, I thought them fighting for, top 12, top eight at best this year would have been a positive step. Now you're looking at it, at them going, no, no, they're like the genuine top eight contenders. Yeah. And like the biggest sign of it is you see a team like the Tides in recent years who haven't been top eight contenders, but they're piling on the points because they can attack. Like the Doggies have got, I think, the second best defense in the NRL behind yeah. the Panthers. So, and you look at them and go, all right, um, still had a bit of clicking to do an attack, probably just, the direction and getting him around the park because Matty Burton's your 5'8 and he's just not a talker. He's not mm. a game manager. He's a very good ball runner. He's a very good footballer. But I think we're going to see him thrive when he does get a good organising number seven, Mitch Woods, hopefully yeah. down the track. I don't know how far away he'll be, but let's be realistic, probably next year, if not the year after. Not, but like – yeah, I completely agree with you. And just the way like he squared up the line, like he wasn't mm. scared to just go straight in as well. Yeah. And like some a halfback that could do that and like put questions in the opposition and then go out the back to like a burden on a sweep. Good luck stopping him. Such a big body. But finally, for for the first time in a long time, like super coach is probably the thing that kept me watching footy the last, mm. you know, six, seven years. <laughs> and I think like talking about the future and how much these sports have grown, like, and you speak to anyone who plays super coach and like there's not many people that play it that like just man, don't really pay attention. Like a lot of the people that play it properly play it and they'll all say the same thing. 
before I started playing super coach, like you just watch your team, maybe the like other big blockbuster game of the round and that's it. Do you think, I think they have started taking it a little bit more seriously, but like if the NRL fully understood the power of super coach and like, if you speak about this and promote this and you get people watching, they're now going to watch majority of the games every single week. I just think it can actually make the sport itself so much bigger. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? I couldn't agree more. And it's a big part of why I launched playbook and, and attack mm. this neat niche area because I just, I can't see a world where it just doesn't continue to expand and expand yeah. and expand. And I don't think, I, I think News Corp know the importance of it, but I don't think they're capitalizing on anywhere near what they should, mm. which is fantastic for me. <laughs> well, yeah. well, it is in one sense because yeah. content wise, you know, there again, there's less competition, but the more they promote it, the better they do by promoting it. And like, I think they need to increase the prize money for starters. Look at News Corp, what it's worth. Yeah. $50,000 for a first prize. Like make it, make it 10K yeah. per week yeah. and increase that prize pool and make the 50K, you know, 200K or something. That's how more people play yeah. exactly because of your reason. And the NRL who have their NRL fantasy, um, for anyone that doesn't know the concept, same super coach, just mm. different ga- version of it. Not as good. Not as good. Not as good. Play super coach. <laughs> yeah. um, but you're exactly right. Like there'll be a bludge of a game at 6 p.m. on a Sunday night. Yeah. And it'll be like, let's call it the Tigers and Dragons. Yeah. No one wants to watch it. They're <laughs> bottom of the ladder, whatever. And, but all of a sudden you've got Zach Lomax playing. Mm-hmm. You will watch that game like it's your team playing grand final. And yeah. you watch every nook and cranny of it. And that's sort of, you know, circling back to where I said, I probably watch games in a different light to a lot of analysts. A game like that where... And again, it could be it's a just use those two teams as example. It could yep. just be the worst game in this buy period that we're in now during Origin, where all the guns are out. It'd be hard for like an analyst to watch that and really care about it and want to watch every minute. But because I have Supercoach players in it, I'm so invested in it. Hundred percent. And I just, as you said, I think it's not to say that the NRL and um, News Corp don't give it a good crack and promote it well and da da, but. I'm with you. I don't think they genuinely know how committed people are mm-hmm. to playing this. Yeah. And they invest all this money to try and bring in, like increase the league, bring in more teams so they can put another game on and they invest tens of millions of dollars doing this. And it's like, if you just spoke about this more, like the potential, like, return on investment for them for oh. a relatively small amount of work. And you talk about, yeah, um, if they put more effort into into that, yeah, there's going to be more competition for you. But imagine then you're talking to, you know, 300,000 exactly. people playing the game, not 160, 170, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just going to grow everything. And like the ad revenue that'd be, because obviously I think about it all from a business perspective as well. The extra ad revenue they're going to be able to bring when the fans is that much stickier when they're watching like yeah. nearly all the you games. Imagine, I think it would be, imagine yeah. how much time people sit there staring at that green field on with their seven oh, or their 25 ridiculous. players on their screen. And the ads that are popping up by the side and you're just sitting there staring and yep. staring at it. Like it's got to be worth a ton. Oh, it's just ridiculous. Said, I just don't see why they're, and again, speaking selfishly from someone who's in this industry, in the industry. Working, but why 150,000? Why can't that be half a million? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And like. Incentivize it though. So yeah. A um, couple of last things. We'll, 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 we'll wrap this up. Um, this is like, okay, if you're listening, this is probably like, this is going to be a bit more niche super coach than the, than the business <laughs> chat has been before. So get excited. So get excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're about to learn some yeah. things. Um, so obviously I just thought, fuck, I've got Tim Williams sitting across from me. I'm going to ask him some questions about my trades <laughs> and thoughts for, for, for coming up. But I'm uh, like I said, I'm a big doggies fan. We just spoke about the, the doggies defense. Um, it's really hard to not bring Teddy in this week. And like you, you bring someone in at that, that value, obviously he's probably going to be the most captain player by far. Are you captaining him and are you com- are confident captaining him? Because I'm not so sure. I know the Bulldogs do have a like big reshuffle backline, but we're just scrambling so well and Roosters are missing key players as well. What's your thoughts about that? Bring him in. I think he's near enough a must-have and and I think he's in about 50% of the, the top 10% overall ranked teams now. So you're sort of looking at that. He's not – because he's so highly owned, you're like, oh, can I make up much ground by getting him? But he scares me so much not to own and especially because all – there are just no good fullbacks for the next four weeks. Like Latrell Mitchell misses three of the next four weeks. Dylan Edwards, two of the next four. Walsh, two of the next four. Drinky minimum. doesn't play the buys. Drinky doesn't play the buys and then plays the Panthers in Penrith next week. They're all bad. Yeah. Like the next best is Chance and Cookstad, who I actually quite like as a buy, as a differential to Teddy. But you look at the team that Teddy's playing for, the draw they've got coming up, 
I think you've basically just got to get him in and bite the bull. Like he's averaging 91 minus that game against the Doggies H-A-A. when he got concussed. Yep. Um, but, no, I'm with you. I think, for the record, my captaincies this year have been terrible. So have mine. Yeah, so good. We're in the They've same boat. killed me. But I'm not confident doing it because I'm with you. Like the Doggies are big outsiders in this game. Hey, you beat them. It ended up being four points, but what was I felt quite convincingly last time out. Yeah. And I just think you've shown this year that you're resilient. You've got, said, the second best defense in the comp. So I don't think Teddy necessarily has the field day people are anticipating. That being said, if the Roosters do turn up, the Doggies are a little bit behind the eight ball, you lose Stephen Crichton, your best defender in the outside backs. If he has a field day and he is at that ownership, I'm just like, I don't want to miss that. Yeah. And also look at my other captains this week. Dave Fafita will be my vice captain. Outside of them two, I don't have anyone close to Teddy in terms of that upside. So See, that's the thing I've got. I'm, I'm VCing Jerome Hughes in the first game. So I'm really hoping he can get like anything towards a 90 and I'll lock that in happily. Um, I would. I was actually considering do I VC Hughes into Fafita, but the Jaden Campbell factor is scaring me off. I'm not sure if he has as much upside playing outside him. So I just, yeah, it's, it's something I yeah. think – um, looking at like the season I've had in terms of captain, same thing. Like I'm really happy with my squad, but I fucking haven't been able to nail oh. a captain all year. So it's really hurt me. Um, other thing as well, super cage coach wise, that has been on my mind. Wanted to, everyone's talking about, okay, bringing Nico straight away back in round 18 versus like Titans or the, the buy against Tigers in round 19. Do you see him as a must have as soon as 18 or 19 or is the Braden Trindle factor potentially putting you off there? I still own. You still own. I held. Sell. Yep. And and I'm fine. W- I'm fine with it. I do need him to go 90 to 100 to stem the bleeding of cash. I was very willing to to drop cash by holding with that big break even, but I didn't want to burn two trades because everyone who sold him has to get him back in. Yeah. I'm just like, why would I do that? Obviously, the people that did it is because of money. Yeah. And I banked on him not getting picked for Origin 2 when everyone sold. And people sold thinking, all right, particularly if he does get picked for Origin 2, those who held on to him are going to be screwed. Mm-hmm. So thankfully from a selfish super coach perspective, he did miss out. And I'm fine with it. But as I said, I do. So what did you say the draw was? He's got – He's got Titans in 18 and then the buy, he has Tigers in round 19. Yeah. So I think you have to have Really both. scary. But also Jerome Hughes is – look at the form he's in. And Sam Walker with the Roosters draw – those are my two halves. It's like I'm hoping one yeah. of them is a clear winner and one's a clear oh, leader. So he, I'm just feel like he, you can go to Nico. He, yeah, it'll be interesting who you sell out of those two. I reckon there'll be a decision in round 18. So Nico will play next week, whoever the Sharkies have got, and he'll drop another ton of cash. He's probably still going to have a – he'll probably have a break even about 120, which for him is very, very attainable. Very attainable. So people might hold off, and it could be for like, a, like you said, a Jerome Hughes or a Sam Walker. And I think people will be going, do I need to do this this week? Can I just wait a week? Like these boys are going awesome. And I feel that round 18 f- matchup is one where Nico just goes bonkers. And worst case, you need to have him by round 19 anyway. So I would be biting the bullet. Again, there's a lot to play out between now and then. Mm. But, I mean, as an owner, by all means, don't buy him. But <laughs> as someone who's also been burnt by numerous Nico 150s in the past as a non-owner. Yeah, I think um- – Oh, look, it's, he's all, that was always the plan now that I'm going to bring him back in. But if Hughes and Walker are both really doing well personally, um, look, it'd be very scary to not aim for those two matchups. But I think with Trindle, like I had Nico at the start of the season yeah. and I sold him right before Trindle left the team and he started pulling out hundreds uh, every week again. So I had to get him back. I think I want to see him do it with Trindle and the team one, at least once before I bite the bullet because Trindle is so much more dominant than a Matt Moylan and he does command a lot of that ball. You look at um, Mulatalo on the wing, how much better he is in, with with. Um, Trindle in the team. So, yeah, something to consider. And I thought, you know, while I've got Tim in, I'm going to get his thoughts. And is there anyone else for the run home you've got your eye on that you think you're going to get in? Nate Cleary, someone not really many people are talking about or? Just thinking any any real flyers for the run home. I'm like, people keep asking me in like uh, the WhatsApp chat, the question and answer, who your fullbacks, what's your fullback plan for the run home? What's your fullback plan for the run home? I'm like, I don't know don't because know. it changes so quickly. Like. The form Teddy's in, I can't, and the run they've got going, I can't see myself tra- trading Teddy. But then, like, if the Bunnies stay, like, rejuvenated and playing all right, you're going to want Luttrell. I am Reese Walsh's biggest fan. And even though Supercoach-wise, 
He's been very good, but he's probably not quite the ceiling we've ex- we're waiting for him to hit. You know it's coming. I think he's going to be that high ownership. I kind of want to get on Reese Walsh will run home. Mm. Tom Trebojevic comes back at fullback, which is meant to be round 18, and starts exploding on the run to the finals. Like there'll be him. So, hey, there are a lot of options, but I don't know, maybe someone – I would love for Brian Toto to go back to the right wing yeah. and get away from that left edge where he doesn't touch the ball outside Drome Luai. If he went back to the right wing, he'd be unreal, but you just don't touch it on the left. No, nah, no. Nah. And, like, I think personally with the fullbacks, like, I've, I've only got Teddy now. I think oh, I've just brought in um, Fletcher Sharp for my second fullback. Hopefully he doesn't get dropped or any injuries happen. Um, but I think as well where my head's at, it'll be it'll – be, Teddy and Trell is the plan right now. Obviously, Tommy Turbo is the big, you know, wild card factor. Yeah. How is he going to come back? Manly's draw for finals is crazy. So I think there's there's a lot of exciting things, and it's just like you know, being me, me being able to nerd out about footy and take my mind yeah. off business sometimes uh, is 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 the best. I give you two more to nerd out on, and one is, I'm still a non Adam Fanua Blake owner, which haunts me, uh, especially going into the Titans game this weekend where he scored a double against them last time. But I'm okay with it just in that front row four position. I wish I owned, but like I could buy him this week, but it cost me Teddy. I'm like, I'm going yeah, Teddy no every way. day of the week. I might just look at going against him for the rest of the season and getting Payne Hass in post origin because I think people are going to be getting really low on trades when Payne Hass becomes a trade, like around 20. They'll look, most people already own Fanil Blake and they'll have a Curran or a Terrell May or something. So I can get Payne Hass and go a little bit of a point of difference there. But the other one who probably my NRL man crush, dirt cheap. Back in the game, Cam Murray. Yeah, I heard I you can't talking wait to, to, to get Cam about that. Murray back in my team. Uh, Murray doesn't really appeal, appeal to me too much, but I think you're right with the Payne Haas thing. I have, you know, Fanua Blake in my front row with May and and Tarpany I bought last week. A little bit disappointing, but I needed the need the number. I was caught short. But like Brisbane are only like just in the top eight. I think they're gonna need him to play big exactly. minutes on the run home. So I think that could be a real winner for you. Um, but yeah, exciting times, man. Um, we've spoken a lot about your journey for those listening as well that have made it through the super coach stuff that aren't already subscribers. Cause I know a lot of your subscribers <laughs> will be listening to, to know more about the journey. Where's the best place that they can find you either on online on the site or on socials? Yeah. So, um, either or subscription wise, if interested in that one, yep. uh, the SC playbook website. So scplaybook.com.au just had a complete revamp. So we've also added uh, stat HQ. So a dedicated super coach, uh, and also like NRL data center, which is yep. cool, but, um, the menu on site can subscribe otherwise uh we'll never forget to do this shout out something like just help us out and, and follow the socials they're, yeah. they're, they're getting there but mate, twitter facebook instagram tiktok all of them so yeah jump on there sc playbook and like as i said before someone that's subscribed for the last last couple of years like the value for what you spend is like above and beyond so it's like such a good in, investment for that like just as a hobby everyone's working their jobs in the week and they want a little escape on the weekend and i think that's like that's the, that's something that's so good about that I think isn't really spoken about enough, like super coach and the content that you would put out guru bloke. Like I know there's so many people struggling in different ways, whether it be family, whether it be finances, whether it be work and they finish and they put on one of, one of these podcasts and it just makes them happy for that period of time. And it lets them escape from whatever they're dealing with. And if all these podcasts got turned off, I know a lot of people would really struggle with how to feel that. So I think that's another really positive thing about the content you guys all put out. So I appreciate you guys doing yeah, that as well. It's very fittingly named fantasy sports. Yeah. As you said, mate, for people that are doing a bit tough day to day in their lives and that for whatever reason, it's an escape. Like sport is for us. Fantasy is another level of it. A hundred percent. And like for those that have like watched footy, you know, their whole life and they've been around it and they've never tried it. Like I would, de- I would definitely say try. It's the best thing you'll ever do. Like in terms of enjoying watching footy, but you'll also hate yourself from time to time. Yeah, so be yeah. prepared for that. I expect that. <laughs> <laughs> expect that. But in a good way. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Tim Williams, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. Really, really do. It's great to connect. Um, and yeah, I'll be obviously following you anyway from, from here on out. But um, thank you and good luck for the rest of the season. No, no, thanks for having me, mate. Cheers. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.